Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order Monday, December 16th at 7.02 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. We're going to be led in our Pledge of Allegiance. That you want to introduce our young lady? Good evening. We will be led in our Pledge of Allegiance by Kyla Newkirk, who is the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Eric and Monica Newkirk, and the granddaughter of our executive assistant, Ms. Hattie Johnson. Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member Katati. Here. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Moffitt. Here. And Council Member Shule. As we all know, this, this past weekend, uh, Nelson Mandela completed his, uh, his extraordinary journey, one that led him from prison to presidency, uh, making him a global symbol of endurance and reconciliation. And he was read, led late to rest uh, yesterday in his hometown in South Africa. Uh, Durham, like so many places all over the world, recognizes and honors what he did in the name of freedom and forgiveness. Not just for the people of all colors in South Africa, but all over the world. And I'd like to read this proclamation in honor of Nelson Mandela, and I would ask Owen Scott if he would join me, please. Owen was one of our persons who had asked that, uh, I've had, had many people to ask for a proclamation, but Owen. Thank you. Uh, Owen felt very strongly that uh, we as a city uh, should honor the work and memory of Mandela. Uh, a friend of his, former North Carolina resident, resident Dina Leonard, uh, wrote a song and produced a short video in Mandela's honor, and we're going to hear that after this proclamation. And the proclamation reads, whereas the city of Durham seeks to commemorate and honor the legacy of Nelson Mandela, as his ideals of peace, reconciliation, and equality for all set a standard for humanity and compassion that we strive to uphold, whereas Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years for his fight against South African anti-apartheid rule and was finally liberated in 1991, whereas he was elected as South Africa's first black chief executive and his government focused on dismantling the legacy of apartheid through tackling institutionalized racism, poverty, and inequality, and fostering racial reconciliation, whereas we, the people of Durham, recognize that it's time to recall civil movements from previous generations and assure that we are not allowing discrimination, oppression, and denial of basic human rights to creep back into our nation, whereas we challenge all of our elected officials to review current and relevant issues that affect our community, such as workers' rights, access to health care and healthy food options, and accessible education, which supports our founding ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whereas the compassion that Nelson Mandela felt for his community is what compels our city, our state, and nation to lead the way in recognizing the continued struggles and injustices endured by many that still demand our attention and humanity. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do proclaim December 16th, 2013, as a day to honor Nelson Mandela in the city of Durham and to encourage all of our residents to reflect on the significant impact he made in our world and to commit to keeping his legacy alive by working to er eradicate 
inequality and injustice in our nation. And with my hand in the corporate solar seat of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 16th day of December 2013, and I'm going to ask Owen to join me for comments that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you uh, to the entire city of Durham, our wonderful city, our wonderful government. Um, what this means, uh, I'm not totally sure, but I think um, the way I see it, we have, so many of us have taken the liberty to get it wrong for so many years. I think it's now time to get it right. Um, it's not in the history books from this little girl to all of us. We saw the man. I think we should uh, try to do something about what he taught, what we learned. And I think if we don't do it, then we probably won't. So what this proclamation means, thank you again, is uh, we started it here in Durham. We're going to sign it, as many signatures, as many governments, towns, organizations. I'm going to send it to David Price, our congressman. I'm going to send it to Daughters of Confederate Republic. I'm sending it wherever. And I think we want to sign it and we want to pass it on. And we started it here in Durham, and I think that everyone can take part of it. It's called uh, Amanja Awetu. Miss Regina Leonard, I, I, I can't believe she did it. She just, she wrote it. It came, just came out of her. Um, she's a resident of this area, and she's not even here. She's in California. Um, and she sent it, and she did it. And I thank her, and I thank you. So can we throw the video that we have? Amana, away to Amana, away to Amana, away to Amana, away to Amana, I wear to it always seems impossible until it's done. Don't give up, my sweet love. Don't close your eyes now. There's too much love. We'll win this fight. As they lay my away dear down, away still we rise. How we rise, I'm on to I wear to. We are born free. I am free. I am free. We To be free is not merely to cast off one's chain, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. I am master of my fate. I am the captain of my destiny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, the words that she was repeating is in Zulu, and um, those were actual um, people, uh, native of, of that land, and it means uh, power to the people. Thank you. When you see the proclamation, I don't know if it's going to be online, if you'll see it physically, but we want to pass it, sign it, sign it, sign it, and we're just going to send it to our next town or whomever. Thank you again. I guess the uh, city manager, if he would. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, yeah, I think Rhonda Parker, director okay. of Parks and Recreation, is going to introduce the next. Uh... 
Thanks, Sarah Marlott. item. Thank you, Rhonda. Good evening. I'm Rhonda Parker, Director of Durham Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, City Council, City Manager, City Attorney, and residents of Durham. I am pleased to introduce to you Conrad Rensberg, who is the owner of Absolute Dental Services and the founder of the Absolute Care Foundation. In late May of 2013, they contacted DPR staff about a significant donation. They wanted to renovate a park. And we had had various conversations with the Carroll Street community about their Carroll Street Park and some of the needs that they had and thought that this was a great opportunity to bring them together, to breathe new life into this small park. The foundation and the staff of Absolute Dental Services donated $14,680 during the renovation of this park. They have agreed to adopt the park for many years, which extends extraordinary benefits of the work that they have done at the park. Their commitment will continue and that to have a profound impact on the community and the residents of the neighborhood. I hope that this project is the beginning of a long and mutually beneficial partnership for the foundation and the city of Durham. Conrad Rensberg. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Maybell, thank you for honoring Madiba. I was born in South Africa and um, I am a product of Nelson Mandela and I had the honor of going back a couple of months ago and I could actually witness the difference in how the people are getting along and interacting with each other and how big a change this man truly made in South Africa. He was a truly amazing man and I think he taught all of us so much. It was a very special moment for me as well to be here tonight with, uh, with Alma Diba passing. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes and they told me I have five minutes where they're going to cut the microphone off. I know you guys have a lot of things to do tonight, but if you can um, give me a few minutes, I'd like to tell you about our foundation. Um, but let me start by saying thank you to all of you in this room for making our city beautiful. Uh, Deepak, you know, the, the tobacco road we have nowadays. I'm so proud to bring friends to Durham and they they have this perception of Durham and they go, wow, this place is amazing. And I think you guys do an immaculate job and we're so happy and so proud to be a small part of that. So my foundation uh, is the foundation of um, Absolute Dental Lab. Absolute Dental Lab is located on uh, University Drive. I've been at Durham Knight for 15 years now, been in the same location for the last 10. And we've brought together a truly exceptional team of ceramics technicians from all over the world. We have 12 nation nationalities. And uh, what we do is dental prosthetics. Uh, so basically we'll take a smile that doesn't look so great. Patient will go to a dentist, they will cut the teeth back. And what we'll do is then put dental prosthetics back in place, ceramic dental prosthetics to replace the natural dentition of uh, what the patient once lost. So a very artistic group of people we brought together. Um, we are currently one of the most successful dental labs in North Carolina. Uh, we've, uh, the lab is 20 years old today, or 20 years old next year, I'm sorry. And I'm very proud to lead this group of people. Um, so we found out kind of the hard way that, you know, um, what we do is not as important as what we do through what we do. If you can do what you're good at and, and be in the fortunate situation of or um, area of giving back to the community, then it really defines what you do. Our first outreach into Durham was with a One Hit Foundation, and they take uh, children off the street and teach them boxing, amateur boxing. So we had a great fight night down at the uh, Durham Armory a while back. My whole team was there, and we were glad to co-sponsor something like that. Um, the, so our, our, our goal is to be a part of our community. We do a lot of give a smile. We met uh, Amy Hildreth, 23 years old, lost all her teeth due to misdiagnosed Lyme disease. And to see a young woman of that age uh, walking around with removable dentures and how she evolved by our donation. So what we, what we did was I got a group of surgeons and uh, prosthodontists from from our Durham community together, and they all donated their time and their skills, and we were able to give Amy her smile back. So what our foundation does as well is bring our community together to show what we can do, and uh, this prosthesis is one of those that's based on dental implants, 
screw down into the mouth. And let me show you the difference uh, that we could make in Amy's life. When we met her originally, you know, this was Amy the first day we saw her. And that was Amy four months later when we did the, uh, the prosthesis. Now, this really is a life-changing experience. But what I found was my team, uh, they're just making another set of teeth. So we said, let's reach out a little further and let's show them what a difference we can make and how good it feels to reach out to the, to the community. We found a family um, that has been, or that really had a hard time, lost her husband, her mom, and her 17-year-old son to cancer had really no resources left. They lived in a house um, that had no sewage, no water. And one Sunday night, I was sitting at home, and uh, I hate to admit, but I think I had a beer or two, and I looked at uh, the extreme home makeover, and I thought, well, that looks pretty easy. And I said to my team, let's, uh, let's take this family, and how about we do an extreme home makeover? And everybody was all gung-ho because it looks so easy if you do it in an hour. Uh, we went in on Sunday afternoon. We got the Raleigh Rescue Mission to come and help us. We moved the family into a local hotel. And for seven days, we spent 2,600 hours with 95 volunteers, and we completely redid their house for them. Now, this was uh, 60 technicians, a few people from, uh, from Jiffy Lube, a few people from UFC Gym, and uh, we made it happen. And you can see the before and after results, and we did all of that in seven days. So what it shows you is, you know, if you bring regular people together and you give them a purpose. I was telling Ms. Uh, Parker earlier that the guy who donated all the landscaping came to me and said, I've been looking to do something good for so long and this is such a great opportunity to give back. And as you can see, that was the bedroom before and that was the bedroom after. So our team did such a great job, but it was not just giving to this family, but it was also showing our team what a difference we can make in the lives of others. I think we really truly touched those people's lives. Now, um, I think to define our foundation, I'd like to show you this uh, clip WRAL did on our, on our house project and probably explain to you why we do this and why I'm so proud to be a part of this. Oftentimes, a cancer survivor will say the experience is a disguise. They tend to appreciate life a little more, take less for granted. One local man who survived stage three colorectal cancer is now paying it forward. The Orioles Bruce Milworth takes a look at his foundation's first major project. Since these pictures were taken a week ago, it's been a mad rush to finish the six-day renovation project. Gwen Griffiths and her children haven't been home since last weekend. Welcome to your new house. The real shocker came when they stepped inside for the first time. This is your new living room. Look at this place! Oh, oh my God! Oh, right. God. oh thank you, Lord! Oh, thank you, Jesus! Griffiths had been emotionally and financially drained. In the last few years, she lost her mother and husband to cancer. Then earlier this year, her 17-year-old son lost his battle to the disease. I am so grateful. I am so grateful. So thankful. This project is even possible. Because after Conrad Rensberg recently survived cancer, he changed his outlook on life. That we might not have another day to do good for somebody else and uh, leave a legacy instead of just, you know, taking, be able to give. He and his business partner started a new foundation to help others. They heard about the Griffisons, that there was no running water in the house because the pipes were so bad and the sewage was backed up. And once we saw the conditions, the terrible conditions she was living under or living in, we said this is the project for us. They cleared the house and started from scratch. With new walls, new ceilings and floors, fresh paint and new tiles, there's a bigger bathroom, donated furniture and art, and newly built closets. It's a door to a fresh start. The house is amazing. I've never seen it this beautiful before. I never have. I love it. Bruce Meldworth, WRL News, Willow Spring. Such joy after such heartache. The Absolute Care Foundation had roughly 95 volunteers put in 2,600 man hours. Dozens of area businesses also supported the project. To learn more about the foundation, look for this story on WRL.com. So I hope... Um, 
you know, that in future, I, I really hope I can stand here every year and show you what we've done in our community, and, and that's kind of our dream. So we identified the Carroll Street Park. Um, I know if you guys have ever been there, it was a little hole in the, a hole in the forest. I didn't really know it was a park. Um, my team went in, we, uh, we did some, some tree re-sculpting. The uh, basketball had a six-foot hoop. We put in a nice standard regulation which felt like a 20-foot hoop to me. Uh, I realized I'll never be a basketball player. But the community truly came together. I was telling Ms. Rhonda, you know, one of the neighbors came over and said, oh, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. And by Saturday afternoon, we had half the neighbors helping. All the kids were out there pushing wheelbarrows. And uh, we could transform this park. And on Sunday, we gave it back to the community with a nice big cookout and a barbecue. And we had 15 of our... Uh, business partners, you know, some local dentists, some of the big implant companies, national implant companies, donating time and uh, money to this project. So to us, it was truly amazing to see just putting these people together, just helping and saying, hey, you know, we'll be the vehicle to get you guys to do something. What a big difference we can truly make in our community. So I'd like to compliment, you know, the help I received from, from, from Durham Parks and Recreation. And I hope from here on out we can, we can do great projects. And uh, you know, with that, I would like to thank you for your time and hope that I can stand up here next year with the same message. Thank you so much. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, your, your work, in particularly in, in our community, but uh, as, as you do it uh, throughout, throughout the region, I, I constantly tell people that Durham is a city that's very caring and, and giving, and uh, you certainly epitomize that in the work you did. I had a chance to go by the park since you've done it, and I, I've seen the transformation, so I'm sure uh, the community as well as the city is very proud of what, what, what you guys did, and thank you for that. Uh, I don't normally talk about things that, that I do because I, I go a lot of places as mayor, but I, I just thought uh, in view of... Um, this presentation and uh, maybe some other news that's not so good that, that had in, we had in Durham. I, I just want to say a few things about our community. Um, th this evening, I, I had an opportunity to go over to the <coughs> John Avery Boys and Girls Club. And I was invited to come over because um, it's a young group of, I guess you call them mentors, that have taken an active involvement in some of our young people in our community. Uh, this happens to be a football team called the Durham Raiders. They're in the seventh and ninth grade. They're from different schools in, within the community. And they recently won the Turkey Bowl uh, for the age group in Charlotte this week in terms of the football. And they'd want me to stop by to take a photo with the, uh, with the football team. But uh, what, what was more important to me is the fact that a lot of good things happen in our community. A lot of different groups, both groups and individuals uh, come together to try to try to make a difference. And this is one, one of the examples that was done this evening. Uh, but the other part about Durham, it looks like we are fast becoming a city of champions in athletics. I mean, if we look at what's happened with the Duke uh, football team, certainly Duke basketball team, uh, Duke uh, women's men and, men and women's basketball team, recently Southern High School uh, attained the championship in the 3A football, first time in the state. Uh, even NCCU is coming back with his basketball team and his women's basketball team. Um, but there are a lot of good things that happen in our community, uh, some not so good. But I, I just hope the uh, good things uh, that we hear don't hear enough about uh, certainly outweigh some of the challenges that we ha have in this community. And it's because of efforts like what we've seen this evening and efforts of a lot of people in this community that make things happen for a good way. And I'm constantly talking about good things happening in Durham, and uh, it's certainly because of the people in our community. I, I just wanted to, to say that because sometimes we take a lot of things for granted, uh, and we don't necessarily uh, recognize individuals that are doing good things on their own, but are making a difference, not just in the city, but in the lives of uh, a lot of our young people, particular people that uh, need the help. So. Uh, I constantly say good things are happening in Durham in spite of some of the challenges that, that we see in this community, but I'm still convinced that we're going to be up to meeting those challenges. Having said that, I'm going to recognize uh, 
Council members for any comments that they may have or want to make. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, recognizing that this is the final official session of the Durham City Council for the calendar year 19, I'm sorry, 2013, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize that 50 years ago, 1963, uh, was a pivotal year in the human and civil rights history of Durham. Thus far this year, there have been several community programs in celebration of the golden anniversary of the North Carolina Fund, the civil rights marches, and the principled leadership of the then newly elected mayor, Wentz Grabaric. However, in my estimate, one of the most crucial and catalytic factors in the racial integration of restaurants, movie theaters, and other public facilities in our city was the courageous full-page newspaper advertisement that listed hundreds of individual citizens who encouraged local merchants and business people uh, to serve and hire people without regard to race. This full-page advertisement included several people who would go on to become local elected officials, including Robert Ghirardelli, Margaret Keller, and Sylvia Kirkhoff. I did not want this 50th anniversary year of that newspaper advertisement to pass without the City Council acknowledging these brave citizens, several of whom are still living and working for positive change in Durham. I have placed a copy of the advertisement at each of your places. Also, a few additional copies have been placed at the clerk's desk. I am certain that you will see names with whom you are familiar. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. It's very, very appropriate, and thanks for bringing that to all of our attention and recognition. Uh, any other comments by council members? If not, uh, we'll proceed with the priority items first by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. No priority items. Likewise, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. First being the consent agenda. Consent agenda are items that can be approved with a single vote by the council unless a council member chooses to have an item removed. We'll discuss that later. Likewise, if someone in the audience asks for an item to be removed, we'll discuss that item later also. Uh, first item is approval of city council minutes. Item three is Workforce Development Act, youth contract with program element provider. Item four is the Workforce Investment Act, Youth Contract with Community Partnerships, Inc. I recognize the city man, city would, would, mayor pro tem. I'd like to hold that for a moment. This is item four, okay. All right. Uh, item five is Durham Arts Council, Inc. Building and Services Agreement. Item six is acceptance of a donation from Absolute Care Foundation for the renovation of Carroll Street Park. Item seven is lease of non-residential property and contract for services with D3 Community Outreach, Inc. Item eight is amendment number three to the interlocal agreement between the City of Durham and the Durham Public School Board of Education for the joint renovation and use of Holton School. Item nine is Holland Alley, revocable use easement. Item 10 is 2014 Financial Crimes Task Force Grant. Item 11 is amendment to fitness medical risk training contract for psychological services. I needed to pull item 10, 2014 Financial Crimes Task Force Grant. And also item 11, uh, Amendment to Fitness Medical Risk Training Contract for Psychological Services. Item 13 is City, youth, youth, city Sewer Use Ordinance, Chapter 70, Article 4, Revision and Wastewater Pretreatment and a Local Agreement with Durham County. Item 14 is an item that can be found on the General Business Agenda. Items 15 through 26 are items that can be found on the general business or general agenda. Entertain a motion for the approval of consent agenda items with the exception of items 10 and 11. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, we, I'm sorry. Four. Four. Oh, I'm sorry. And Four. the mayor pro tem's items. Item. That's, four. That's been pulled. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move to the general business agenda. Item 14, 2013, third quarter crime summary report. Recognize Chief Lopez.
Good evening. This is the police department's 2013 third quarter report. The quarterly report covers our department's six performance measures, violent crime, property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, staffing levels, and significant events during the third quarter. I'm here tonight to share information about the third quarter report, which is very good. But we do realize that we have had some recent violent crime that has made the headlines. We've been focusing on these incidents and we have made several arrests. Our part one index crime totals for the first nine months of this year are the lowest they've been in 14 years. Our part one violent crime totals are the lowest, the second lowest in 14 years. 2005 was lower. And our part one property crime totals are also the lowest, the second lowest in 14 years. Last year was slightly lower. Violent crime was down by 8% during the first nine months of 2013 compared to the first nine months of 2012. The decrease was due in large part to a significant drop in the number of aggravated assaults. We conducted several violent incident responses this year, which we believe has reduced the total amount of retaliatory violence. Property crimes were up slightly from the first nine months in 2012. This is due to an increase in the number of larcenies, which make up more than half of all reported part one crimes. Burglaries were down by 6% during the first nine months of this year compared to last year. And they were down 19% for the first nine months in 2011. We introduced our resident, residential awareness program in the fall of 2011 to target an increasing burglary trend and we believe this burglary has helped us reduce the number of burglaries in the city. Durham Police employees recently made a presentation about the success of this RAP program at the National Kalia Conference in Winston-Salem. We have continued to have larcenies of metals and GPS units this year. We have encouraged residents to keep items like GPS units, laptop, computers, purses, and other valuables from plain view in their vehicles, especially during the holiday season. We have had increases in the number of larcenies from buildings and shopliftings this year. Part one index crime is the total of part one violent and property crimes. Index crime was drowned slightly during the first nine months of 2013 and was at a 14 year low for that period. The largest decreases were in the numbers of reported aggravated assaults and burglaries. The FBI statistics are for cities the size of Durham with a population of 100 to 250,000. Our clearances are above the FBI average in all categories at this time with the exception of homicides. All clearance numbers are preliminary and we expect them to increase. The police department responds to more than 4,000 priority one calls for service during the first nine months of 2013. Our target average response time for priority one calls is 5.8 minutes, and we met that goal. Another goal is to respond to at least 57% of our priority one calls in under five minutes. We did not meet that goal. And although it's an aggressive goal, we're gonna continue going after it. Our sworn positions were fully staffed and at the end of the third quarter, and remain fully staffed at this time. Ten new officers graduated from our basic law enforcement training academy, BLET, in July. We currently have ten recruits in BLET Academy that started in August. We had 14 vacancies in our non-sworn positions at the end of the third quarter. Many of those positions are in the process of being filled at this time. We had another successful national night out celebration this year with more than 100 communities participating. We were recently notified that this year, the National Association of Town Watch ranked Durham Police Department 13th out of 132 similar sized cities across the nation competing for National Night Out honors. This year, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of National Night Out along with the 30th birthday of Durham's Crime Stoppers. And like you said, Mr. Mayor, a lot of good things are happening in the city of Durham. The Durham Police Department has been participating in several community outreach and safety initiatives 
during this holiday season. On Saturday, December 7th, more than 60 officers gathered at the Target on Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard to help 40 children shop for Christmas gifts. The Fraternal Order of Police provided funding for the shopping spree. Our community resource unit will be conducting shopping sweeps throughout the city to alert shoppers about careless behaviors that might attract thieves, such as leaving purses in shopping carts and leaving gift items in plain view in vehicles. On Thursday, district, Central District officers provided a holiday lunch and entertainment for residents of the Hosiery Mill Apartments at 804 Anger Avenue. Bicycle officers leave Morton and Bala uh, Kehalo played guitar and sang holiday songs as well as original songs for the residents. During this month, officers throughout the city will be helping those less fortunate by buying gifts, holding coat drives, and coordinating holiday meals. I want to end this presentation by discussing our recent Kalia Gold Standard Assessment Award. Our department is the first and only department with more than 300 employees in North Carolina to achieve this distinction. And this places the Durham Police Department in a higher tier among accredited agencies. This assessment focused more on departmental practices versus just policy compliance. We have maintained continuous CALEA accreditation since 1991 and received a notorious award for our efforts. Two of our department's innovative programs were highlighted at the recent National CALEA Conference. Employees made presentations about our Residential Awareness Program, which is part of our intelligence-led policing initiatives, and also our Police Training Officers Program. We're, we're very pleased to be able to share some of our successful programs with other law enforcement agencies. Also, in October, our Forensic Sciences uh, Services Unit became the first agency in the state to receive accreditation under ISO IEC standards, which is specific to inspection units and are now used to certify crime scene units and crime lab sections for forensic testing. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, before I hear comments from council members, I have, uh, we have one person that wanted to speak on this item. Uh, I'm going to allow two minutes on this, Ms. Victoria Peterson, item 14. Ms. Peterson. I'm not sure, Mr. Mayor, but one of the questions I'd like to just ask in the police chief's report, he has here for domestic violent crimes, um, you have murder, rape, robbery. I'm not sure if that's an accident, how that is done on this page. But it looks like you have here, as I read this this year, over 355 domestic violent crimes. So maybe somebody, I, I think this is probably a mistake how this is headed up on the top. But Mr. Mayor, we've got a serious problem going on here in this city. And the mayor knows I have spoken to him privately and when I talk to him privately, I don't mind having, I don't have a problem in saying that publicly. I have spoken to numerous persons in this community. I'm gonna ask the city council publicly what I've asked the mayor privately. We've got to get a new police chief in this community. We've had too many murders, too many deaths, too many shootings going on in this community, particularly in the African American community. I was talking to someone on the phone today. Over the last probably, what, 48 hours, we've had two murders, uh, another death by motor vehicles and two other persons shot in this community. By the end of this year, so far I believe it's over 30 some persons in this city, just the city alone, that we have had murdered. And Mr. Davis, you are the new person on the block. We, this community has to address the crime problem. I think all the programs that the police chief is doing, I think with his officers, are great. But that is not helping the people that live in my community, particularly the African American community. And now we have some problems going on um, with the Latino community. And I just want to say this, and I think I said this to Steve Shul. This police chief is costing us money. Every one of those deaths, 
those persons are going to be hiring law, they are going to be hiring attorneys. It's going to cost this community monies, and we've got to address that. Ms. I know, Mr. Ms. Mayor, Ms. you Ms. want me to sit down now. Well, but I, 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 please. I, I, you, have, you had two minutes. I think you made your point very clearly. So you had two minutes, and it's on the record. Well, I would love to get another record. minute, Mr. Mayor. I know you would, but we're not going to do it tonight, Ms. Peterson. We've got two minutes. Thank you. You made your point. You okay. understand? Thank you. And thank you, sir. Quite welcome. Uh, let me ask other comments or questions by members of the council on, on the report. I recognize Councilman Shule, Councilman Davis, and are you pointing to somebody? Well, I just tell them what that's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to first say uh, to the chief and the members of the department uh, that uh, it's great to see that our crime rate is continuing to go down and uh, the lowest rate in 14 years is, is, is great work. And so thank you to you and your staff. I um, also wanted to uh, use this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the issues that have been swirling around our police department that I think we all need to, uh, I, I don't think we ought to let the report go by without at least acknowledging and talking about it a little bit, Chief, so I'm going to make some remarks and I'm not asking you to respond to them, but uh, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about these issues lately uh, and in the last couple of weeks I've tried to kind of re-educate myself a, a little bit about our, our police and what, what we're doing. Uh, I attended another CompStat meeting, which is an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing experience where our officers and our, our, our command staff, uh, our captains, uh, do this tremendous job of going through all of the details of crime in each district in Durham. And uh, I know the department is trying to think of a way to bring this to a wider public. There's a lot of confidential information there, but I hope we can do that, Chief, because it is such an impressive, impressive thing. Uh, I rode with an officer recently, Officer Hayes, in District 3 one recent Saturday night. I've, I've been reading the documentation that Fade has offered of statistics about our police department's traffic stops and searches. I've been reading our police department's very thorough responses to those. Um, attended a vigil recently for a homicide victim organized by the Religious Coalition for Nonviolent Durham, and I, I try to go to them, those when I can. Uh, I attended the chief's press conference recently uh, and spoke there to both Chief Smith and, and Chief Marsh. And I've been speaking to people who've been working with the Huerta family, including those who simply want to figure out a way to raise the funds to get Jesus Huerta a burial. Uh, today I took a long walk with my colleague Don Moffitt and uh, batted around a lot of these issues and, and Don helped me think about it a lot. So I say all this to, to assure our community and our police department that all of us up here take these issues very, very seriously. And I know that all of my colleagues share the same concerns that I have. All this thinking hasn't given me anything profound to say or anything definitive, but I do have a few observations I want to offer. And uh, first and foremost is this. The Durham Police Department is an excellent department filled with men and women, black, white, and Hispanic, who care deeply about our community, both its safety and its general welfare. I rode with one of them two weeks ago, and let me tell you just a little bit about that ride. Riding with Officer Hayes, I think most of all I was impressed with the many and various things a police officer is called to do during five hours on the average Saturday night. Officer Hayes was very proactive, both in responding to assignments he received over the radio and in directed patrols that he initiated on his own. He encountered several situations in which he made wise and careful decisions. He worked in close communication with his squad. He was called upon to move from one end of District 3 to another, and he did so with excellent knowledge of the territory. I think few people understand, I know I certainly didn't fully understand, the community care function of a police officer, which on this night was almost as important as the crime fighting function. We went to a scene where a toddler had been out, found out in the middle of the street, and Officer Hayes helped someone try to stop harassing phone calls. And when he ended the night pushing a stalled motorist car into a parking lot off of Duke Street at about 11.30 and it was really cold, and I do want to say that I did help push. 
On at least one occasion, Officer Hayes was clearly in what could have been a dangerous situation. He handled it with an eye towards both safety for himself and for the other people involved and with getting the job done. Of course, one thing I had an eye out for was whether or not there was any profiling going on that I could spot, at least in this one situation. And I can say without a scintilla of doubt that Officer Hayes didn't profile anyone or even consider it. In the dark of the night, he was doing his job without regard for race or ethnicity. This is the kind of job that the vast majority of our police force is doing every day. And by and large, our department has the strong support of our community. Mainly our community regards our police officers as friends, as helpers, as protectors, and they want more, not less, policing in their neighborhoods. That is what I continually hear from our PACs and neighborhood groups across the city. Second, I want to be clear at the same time that I take the concerns of the community very seriously. I was very concerned when I read the statistics compiled by Fade and its allies about tra traffic stops and searches. I want to make sure and all of us do, that there is not a hint, not a hint of racial discrimination in the work of our police department. I also want to say that the work of Fade and others has started a sometimes painful, but still useful conversation in the community at large and the city government in particular about these very, very important issues of discrimination. I've been impressed by the good work of Chief Marsh and others in the, the department who've responded so fully and carefully to the statistics compiled by FADE. And I want to thank the mayor for starting us down what I think is a very good process centered now at the Human Relations Commission and soon coming to us at the City Council. During this process, I think it's critical that all of us on council and in the police department give up any defensiveness we might have about these issues. If we're going to improve as a city and a police department, we've got to face any charges about bias or police misconduct with an open ear and an open heart. I know that's hard when we're under attack, but it's necessary if we're going to make positive change. And along these lines, I was really impressed with the conclusions of a report just sent to the Human Relations Commission, which Don Moffat shared with me today. And I can see from this that the department is already taking important steps to examine itself and to change. Just a couple of those conclusions from the department. We are now trying to develop a method of analyzing our officers' individual traffic stop data more closely and to review that annually to ensure that our officers are complying with our prohibition on bias-based policing. That's a great thing, Chief. It's a great thing. Second, we are actively researching training to supplement the state-mandated diversity training. And there's more about that. That's a great thing and very important. Third, it was discovered that, discovered that complainants don't really know what officers are actually dis when that officers are actually disciplined when complaints are sustained. And then there's discussion here about how to do that. And fourth, we're actively working on a protocol that will allow us to release some facts and information regarding critical incidents a little sooner in certain situations. Those are all really good things. And this is impressive to me. The openness to change, which it represents, is just what we need, and it's the right approach. Let's see what other cities are doing who are doing the best job of this. Let's look for solutions for changes in our processes that can help us improve. As good as our police department is, in so many ways, we can all improve. Let's give our department the encouragement to do so. And finally, I want to say a word about the process we're undergoing to give our community information about three cases before us, the case of Jose Ocampo, the case of Derek Walker, and the case of Jesus Huerta. Uh, Eugene Brown has already made what I think is the critical observation here that I want to second. One of our big problems is the disgraceful underfunding by the state legislature of the SBI's forensic office. This does not only affect investigations of our police-related shootings, it affects the entire list of violent cases in this whole state. There are people languishing in jail right now all over North Carolina awaiting trial far too long because the legislature has neglected its duty to adequately fund our justice system, including especially the FBI labs. And I really want to thank Gene for, for beating that drum. Um, so given that reality of the SBI lab, we've got to figure out a different way to inform our public. I understand the need not to undermine the SBI's independent investigation. I understand that need. But at the same time, in all these cases, we have got to figure out a way that we can inform our public of key facts much sooner. This is critical if our police department is going to keep and maintain the confidence of the public in its truthfulness 
and transparency. These are incredibly important assets. The faith that the public has in our police department's truthfulness and transparency, and we must not squander them. I'm not exactly sure how this might occur, but I know that it has to. Far, far too many people have talked to me in the past two weeks about the failure of the city to come forward with enough information in the very sad and tragic case of Jesus Huerta. People want to know how he could have killed himself while in handcuffs, and we have to explain how that could have happened. We have to do a better job of that. And people want to know the truth about why he was able to have a gun in a police car in the police headquarters parking lot while handcuffed. We have to let the people know what happened in that case and that let the chips fall where they may. If a terrible mistake was made that contributed to the tragic death of a young man, that truth must come out. I urge our city manager and the top brass in the department and our city attorney, who I know has an important role in these decisions, to figure out a way to get that full truth out right away. And as for the other investigations, I know that Mayor Bell and our city manager have been on the phone to the State Department of Justice, talking to top people there and urging them to get this process moving. The SBI's failure jeopardizes the confidence of our community, and I thank the mayor and the city manager for trying to move this along. Mr. Mayor, last week I had another discussion with Irene Duanell, who is on the staff of Threshold, the Day Center for Mentally Ill People in Durham. Irene sang the praises of our police department, and specifically the community intervention training, which I know is so dear to your heart, Chief. The program that many officers undergo to understand the special situations of the mentally ill they frequently encounter on the street. Part of this training is at Threshold, and on the days that the officers are at Threshold, there are as many as 30 of them at any one time. Irene said that she's tremendously impressed with what she calls the 100% commitment of our department to the CIT program, and she believes it is working. She reported that she had two recent instances where officers were needed to respond to an incident. She called CIT, and CIT successfully intervened without escalation in very difficult situations. Instead of ending up in handcuffs, both of these people ended up at Durham Access instead. That is great police work. There's so much going on, so much of that going on every single day in Durham, that great police work. Let's figure out a way to make that the story on the top of everyone's mind in Durham. Not by a public relations campaign, but because we've responded non-defensively and constructively to the criticisms of Fade and others and changed when we needed to change. And because we have done whatever it takes to get the truth out to our community about the controversial cases occupying the headlines and because we have faced that truth head on, whatever it is, and dealt with the consequences, however difficult they might be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for that, those comments. I think they were well constructed. Uh, you hit a lot of the key points, and uh, I may have some comments, but I'm going to move to Councilman Davis at this point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, the, the comments that Steve Shull has given uh, just Really, anything I would say would be um, just reiterating what he's done and said and the research he's done. But I would hope that in addition to what he said, we can give the community of Durham a sense of the transparency that is going on and desired by the community from the police department and that we are given the opportunity to know what the protocols are of the police department when it comes to situations like Mr. Walker's down at the um, plaza, um, the recent issue with a person being handcuffed and still being able to kill himself, and the recent death of a Mr. Taylor uh, who was in bed and was killed uh, by stray bullets. Um, I think the, the, the community is being very, very patient when it comes to the answers that are needed and the protocols that are utilized by the police department so that, so that people can recognize that the good, the good work that you've shared tonight, Chief, um, is reinforced and recognized and praised rather than being criticized in spite of those good things that you reported on. Um, some of these things have been lingering for months, and I know that we don't want to rush to judgment, and we want to allow the investigations to go forward, but too many of them have occurred too, too often, 
and without the kind of transparency that the citizens of Durham deserve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments uh, on this item? Chief, I don't know if you have any comments you want to make. Uh, before that, I recognize Councilman Markin. Excuse me, I just want to take a moment and let people know that there's a lot of information now on the city's website on many of the issues that um, Council Member Shul was just talking about. It's a little complicated. I know people are watching at home. I'm going to tell you how to get to it so that people can find it. I was just spending a minute making sure I knew how to get there. What you'll find there are 24 documents right now. They come from the initial community listening session that the Human Relations Commission held, as well as subsequent responses by the police department. So there's a lot of information that people can access if they're interested in actually going to some of the source material. And the way you get there is go to the city's website, durhamnc.gov. On the left side, there's a link called Inside City Hall. Under that, city departments, neighborhood improvement services. When you get there, on the right side, you'll find a link for human relations. And under that, the fourth heading is news and information. And the link under that, under news and information, is for all of these documents. So um, I just want to make everyone aware that that information is on the website, and people can do uh, further research if they want. The Human Relations Commission is doing a really good work. I think they have at least five meetings scheduled in January and February. Um, to continue their work on this. I've seen that the Civilian Police Review Board is holding a listening session as well. So a, a lot of work is underway, and I think it's all to the good. Chief. Yes, we also have information on our website. We also are on Facebook. We put all those reports out. Uh, also, we're working with uh, the SBI in order to see about getting the information out. I have to say that sometimes the information is not there, and uh, so we cannot put it out. As a matter of fact, uh, many a times we have to make sure that it's factual before we put it out because we're held accountable for what we say. And uh, at the same point in time, we're working very closely with this community. And as far as the young man who was shot when he was sleeping, I think the community needs to get outraged about these things. I really think they should get angry and not wait for my answer. The answer is on the street. It's inside the community. And the community next needs to come forward and let us know what happened there because they're the ones who are going to be able to solve that and assist us. As far as the violence that's occurring in the city of Durham, we need this community to help us. It can't be the police all the time. And I'm very fortunate to have a city where the majority of the community really works with the police department and really makes it happen. That's the only way I can give you those low numbers. That's just the reality of it all. And to expect the police department or the police chief to solve it all, I don't think that that's a reasonable thing to expect. But I will continue for as long as I'm here, uh, hopefully four more, to, uh, to give you the best police department possible. And I am fortunate to have an organization that have men and women who care about this community and they're going to go out there every day in spite of. So thank you. And I also am fortunate to have a council that totally supports this organization and also a city manager who really works with us on a day-to-day -day basis in reference to it to make this not only the best police department in the, t in, in the world, but also part of the best city in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Let, let me say that, again, I, I appreciate fully the comments that our Councilman Shul made with regard to this whole issue in terms of crime, our police department, the transparency of it. Uh, it's no one in this council that has no reason not to be transparent about these issues. None of us were at any of these events that occurred that I'm aware of, so we don't know. And we have to depend on professionals who are given the responsibility for solving these crimes. And uh, as Steve has indicated, I, I was on the phone with the state attorney general uh, along with the city manager a couple of weeks ago. Uh, along with the director of the SBI, and we impressed upon them very strongly how important it was that we come to, they come to some type of resolution on these issues that were before them. And they understood well what the concerns were. In fact, the director of the state SBI's family lives in Durham, so he understands, he understands what, what we're going through, and he has no reason not to do anything other. 
Uh, but it's a lot of components in trying to bring the issues to some type of resolution. It's not only the SBI. Uh, when you have homicides, you have the chief medical examiner. The chief medical examiner is out of the department of HHS. It's not with the SBI. So they have to depend on those results to come in. As you probably know, there were some issues that were going on with the medical examiner's office recently. And so I'm sure there was a certain amount of cautious that was going on to make sure they had it right with whatever they present to us. Uh, then there's the uh, district attorney's office, who will be ultimately charged with trying to bring the, trying any of these crimes to come, come forth. Uh, I've been here long enough to know that you don't want to rest the judgment on these issues. No matter how important they are, you don't want to rest the judgment. Uh, none of us are, 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 are crime solvers. We have probably our own thoughts about how things happen, but that isn't who people are going to rely on. They're going to rely on what's being reported to us from the SBI, the Chief of Medical Examiner's Office, the Police Department, and the District Attorney's Office. And we can't make any of these things happen any quicker than we're trying to do. But there's no reason that we don't want to be transparent. And I'll be the first to say that once those reports come out, that if we find there were misdeeds or misactions taken by our police department, I'll be the first to stand up to say to the city manager, we've got to fix that. And it's up to the city manager to know how to fix it. But until, that, until that's proven, I, I don't want to judge the, the police. I don't want to judge the SBI. I don't want to judge the chief medical officer. I don't want to judge the DA. I, I, what I want to do is continue to stress to them the importance of completing their report and as independent way and as an objective way as possible so we can get to this, the bottom of these issues. And I know they've heard the message. I, I have no reason to believe that they aren't working earnestly to try to bring these results in. But until that happens, uh, you're going to have to trust. You don't have to trust, but I'm asking you to trust uh, this city council to start with because we have no reason to hide anything. No reason to hide anything. And we won't hide anything. But we do have a reason to be professional and ethical about what we do and what we say on very serious matters as such as this. Uh, you just heard the crime report. Uh, what you heard is that violent crime is down uh, based on the reports that's given. Uh, it's down because aggravated assaults are down. Uh, when we look at violent crime in this community, it's robbery, aggravated assaults, rape, and homicides. And homicides are a very small portion of violent crime numbers. But they get the most attention, and I understand why. That's the ultimate crime. Uh, if you look at what's happened on these uh, violent crimes and issues that we have, aggravated assaults, domestic. I mean, that's something that it's hard to deal with as a police officer, as an individual, because it's between individuals. You don't sleep with, we don't sleep with people. We don't know what goes on in people's houses. We, don't, we aren't there to, to, to stop those things. But you know, aggravated assaults domestically are about 18% of uh, violent crimes in this community. Uh, when I look at what's happening with some of our young people and where they are involved in that, uh, 46 of those 1,100 plus violent crimes were committed by teens 16 years or less. So and when we look at homicides, when we look at aggravated assaults, particularly homicides, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of it is black on black crimes. Now, I don't care what people want to say about the police targeting or doing whatever. They're black on black crimes. And we've got to find a way to deal with that. We've got to find a way to deal with that. When you look at it further, you look at the age groups. They typically are persons 24 years or younger. We know, what that, we know what that category is. We have all types of programs where we're trying to target 14 to 24 years of age students to try to find ways to move them in a different direction. But it takes time. So we aren't unmindful of where the issues are. What we're saying is we don't have all the solutions. The police doesn't have all the solutions. It's going to have to be a community beat. And the point I made earlier this evening by talking about what happens at John Avery Boys and Girls Club where people are taking you know, young kids into their wings and mentoring them, we've got to have a lot more of that to happen in this community. But Durham isn't unique either. Durham is not unique either. I mean, I was just on a program this past Saturday, WRAL, and I had um, um, Nelson Dollar, our representative of the budget right uh, for the House, was on the program. And obviously, we're talking about things that happened at the Sandy Hook. But one of the points that I tried to make, 
and Nelson Dollar backed it up, is, you know, a lot of these issues are mental, but we're doing things in Durham. I mean, the comments that Steve made about how many times you see the police officer uh, directing them to um, mental health uh, uh, help rather than putting them in jail. Those things are important, but we don't hear enough about that. But it's happening in Durham, and I think Durham is making great progress. But not for that. We will be far worse off. So again, I, I would just say I understand the impatience that people have. I certainly understand the families of victims of, in these cases. But there's a process, and I would hope that you would allow the process to go through and trust that this city council wants it done as quickly as possible, but we want it done right. We want it done right. So uh, if there are no further comments, again, Chief, I appreciate your report. Uh, you said you want to be here four more years. That's up to the city manager, but uh, <laughs> we, we'll, 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 see what, we'll see where that takes us, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item is item 15, general business agenda public hearings. Item 15 is consolidated annexation, Oaks at Lyons Farm. Good evening, I'm Scott Whiteman with the planning department. First, let me state for the record that notification has been provided and affidavits are in file as required by law for all of the planning department public hearing items tonight. This item is three separate actions by city council related to the annexation of the Oaks at Lyons Farm development. First, a utility extension agreement has been requested by B. Wallace Homes to serve the development. The public works and water management departments have performed a utility impact analysis and determined that adequate sewer and water capacity is available. A voluntary petition for contiguous annexation has also been submitted by the property owner for the site. The budget management services department has performed a fiscal impact analysis based on the most intense permitted use within the permitted initial zoning. And the analysis projects that estimated revenues will exceed ex estimated expenditures immediately upon annexation. Pursuant to state law, the city council is required to apply an initial zoning to newly annexed territory. Staff is recommending an initial zoning of rural residential for the subject property, which will permit up to 17 single family dwelling units. The staff recommends that the council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and the initial zoning for the Oaks at Lyons Farm. Okay, you've heard the staff report this is a public hearing. I'll declare the public hearing to be open. I have two persons that have signed to speak on item 15. Gerard, is that Edens? Is that correct? And Jeff Dozier. Uh, let, let me ask, are, are there persons that want to speak against this uh, Public hearing item. Uh, I need to know in terms of allocating amount. You do? And your name is? Okay. Let, let's start off with 10 minutes on this side and 10 minutes on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. Uh, I'll be brief. I appreciate your consideration of our request to annex uh, this approximately 9.4 acres on Scott King Road. I believe Council, uh, within the last couple of years, annexed the property directly adjacent to this site. Um, so it is contiguous on, on most of the sides. Uh, just want to point out briefly, we did ask staff to look at the additional number of school children that would be generated by, uh, school children being generated. We don't generate school children, but uh, we looked at the additional number of kids that would result from a, a 17 unit development as compared to the nine lots that the uh, county zoning allows and it's an additional three students, so I would like to offer up that prior to the first CO issuance on the property uh, that we would pay a, make a contribution of $1,500, that's $500 per child to the Durham Public Schools as part of our request. Um, again, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have, but uh, I'll stop there, thank you. You're welcome, are there questions by counsel of the proponent? If not, I recognize uh, Mr. Jeff Dozier. Mr. Mayor, just for reference, I have copies of the site plan that Mr. Edens had given me an email copy of. Can I submit that to the board for, for just for viewing during my discussion? Thank you. Mr. 
So Mr. Mayor and City Council, thank you for giving me the opportunity here to speak about this proposed annexation. And um, my name is Jeff Dosher. I live at 106 Silver Pine Court in Lyons Farm. Lyons Farm is a subdivision directly adjacent to the proposed property to be developed or ultimately to be annexed. Um, just a little background. So Mr. Edens had had actually a public information session, I guess, in July of this year. And uh, as somebody who's a single income household, middle, middle class family, I was unable to attend because I received notification approximately eight days prior to the meeting. So I took the email address that I had from Mr. Edens, reached out to him, and he was nice enough to give me probably about 45 minutes of time on the phone to talk about this property, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Um, the reason I rise in opposition is is for as on behalf of myself and the other 10 residents of Silver Pine Court, which is the street that will ultimately be adjacent to this property, is that the lack of consideration that Mr. Edens and Edens Land Development Corp gave to us with our regards regarding our concerns for this property. And the concerns are fairly straightforward. When you look at the map in front of you, there is one entrance to the developed property, and that's coming from Silk Tree Lane. I live on Silver Pine Court. I live adjacent to Silk Tree Lane. We knew eventually when we moved into this neighborhood that some development would be there. We welcome that opportunity. We welcome the addition of new neighbors to, the, to our community. All right, because we have half a dozen families with kids on the street. It's a great opportunity. It's a great neighborhood. The problem is, is that Mr. Eden is not building an entrance that will go out onto Scott King Road. Okay. And so what happens is 100% of that traffic is going to come through our little 100-house neighbor, neighborhood known as Lions Farm. Middle-class families, like I said, we, don't, we knew there was going to be a street eventually, but what we didn't anticipate, because there is an entrance onto the property right now because a house exists on this lot, there is a driveway from Scott King Road, but the developer is proposing to eliminate that to maximize the profit on the lot. So, and again, Mr. Edens was really nice in giving me a lot of time to talk about this. Found out from him he used to work for the city county planning department. He knows all the nuances of what goes on. And that's great because it gave me a lot of insight of information that I didn't really know. And quite frankly, raising a couple of kids, I don't have time to know a lot of that stuff. But the problem here is that if there's 100% of that traffic is going to go down that street, the quality of life for the residents of that section of the neighborhood goes dramatically downhill. We can't play in the street anymore. We can't have the traffic. The construction, and the, while they're building the development, there was even no assurances that that traffic would go directly onto the property from Scott King as opposed to coming through traversing our neighborhood. Now, maybe it may end up being that way that they will use Scott King Road, but they haven't informed us. Um, after our discussion, I asked for his consideration in consultation, he said, with his partners, and that was July 18th, and now it's December 16th, I'm still waiting for a response. So, um, and I think the interesting thing is, and he made the, one of the reasons he said, um, talking about the public information session, he made it very clear to me that they were under no obligation to take any feedback or any input from the adjacent community into their consideration. I was kind of flabbergasted, quite frankly, when I heard that discussion. I, I was downright flabbergasted, because you could have, it's all window dressing then, and at a time when on the national level, this community thinks that Washington doesn't hear us, so they just do their own thing. And we're all, we all look at, at um, politics, we look at government, national, state, and now even local government, at least in my eyes, with a jaded eye because he worked at the Sydney County Planning Department. He's got the friends, he's got the connections internally, and this is just gonna glide right in. And it's, it's very disheartening, quite frankly. Um, I was a former, president of the HOA Association for Lions Farm. And we have a member of the HOA board who's also in the audience, Hunter Metz, right now. The, the concern here is, that, again, we want this property to be developed. We want new neighbors. But there's 17 lots on there, and you know what it would cost? About 90 to 100 grand in profit for him to take one house away and have an entrance on Scott King Road. So it's going to hurt their profit. He also commented to me that they're going to have to pay, potentially, a turning lane. So that would be another 75 or 100 grand or so, whatever the cost of that is. But all we're trying to do here is to preserve the quality of life of the families that are already there. 
We want neighbors. We knew there would be development. We welcome it. We welcome it. But all we're asking the developer to do is to allow an additional entrance from Scott King Road so 100% of the traffic doesn't have to traverse our little cul-de-sac there, our little dead-end street where we have young kids that are playing with street. Come by there, anybody. Mr. Davis, you're, you are you have Ward too. Come every, any Saturday or Sunday when it's above 32 degrees and the sun's out, and you're gonna see half a dozen kids playing around. So I'm sure there's a much more polished way I could have come up here and talked about this issue. But all I'm asking you to do is, is to at least postpone this or send it back to the city county planning department for another proposal to make sure that this developer maybe takes a little bit out of their profit but just to give us the quality of life that we deserve. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Are there comments from the council? Uh, does the proponent have comments that you want to make? I said, do you have any comments you want to make? Do you have, uh, how much time do you have? Nine minutes. You, you've, you've heard the uh, opponent's comments relative to this proposal. Do you have any comments relative to that? In yes, terms I appreciate of the, the opportunity uh, to respond. One, I've never worked for the city county planning department, and uh, this gentleman and, and my, we have may have different recollections recollections of our conversation several months ago. But uh, the the design that that's been printed presented before you is a conservation subdivision. It's a 50% open space development. So of 9.4 acres, we're going to have about 4.7 acres of permanent tree coverage. And, and much of that buffer is behind the lots that are on the street that this gentleman lives on. So there was definitely consideration taken into the neighbors with our design because uh, we put the homes, the, pr the proposed homes, as far away from this adjacent neighborhood as we possibly can. They're right up against the stream buffer. As far as connecting to Scott King Road, a connection to Scott King Road does not void the need to extend the dead end street that is there now. I mean, I understand that, that children play in streets. I have two young kids too, but my kids play in my yard. They don't play in the street. So I, I understand that that's a convenience that, that may be uh, foregone or sacrificed a good bit um, by this connection, but the connection is going to be made regardless of what happens on site. Uh, NCDOT does not like multiple connections to state maintained roads. An additional connection is Scott King Road for 17 lots when there's a stub to the property currently just doesn't make sense. Uh, the area where the connection would go to Scott King Road is directly where a lot of this tree coverage area is located with the design. So uh, in my obviously biased opinion, I think that, that 4.7 acres of tree coverage out of 9.4 acres with 17 lots is a minimal impact to the neighborhood and I would appreciate your support. Thank you, are there other questions? Anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, I'm, I'm, Councilman Brown, I was going to close the public hearing, but go ahead. I want to find out, is anyone else who wants to speak on this item? If not, I'm, you do? Uh, how much time do you have? Does he have? He has three minutes. You have three minutes. I would just offer that I have no agenda. I do live in the neighborhood. I'm not asking for any preferential treatment from the city or the county commission or the planning department. All I'm reiterating is a conversation that I had with this gentleman on the phone. So I assume that the commentary that he provided to me was accurate. I have no, needs, no need to falsify my information or lie to any of you. If you know, and again, we knew there was going to be an entrance to our neighborhood, and we welcome that because then it's an opportunity for my kids to meet new kids in the neighborhood. So we knew that a, that street would eventually connect to another neighborhood. That's fine. We're just asking the city to, to request that the developer have a second entrance on the main road like every other development has in this vicinity by Area of War II. That's all. And it's going to cost them one house on the lot. One house. Thank you. Uh, could, could I ask you one question? I know you said you didn't want you have no reason to falsify. Who, who told you he worked for the city? I had a conversation with this gentleman on the phone in July because I was unable to attend the public information meeting. I travel, I cover the Southeast for my, in my business, and I was unable to attend, which is why I reached out to him via email on the letter that was sent to our neighborhood. But to did, every, he, did he tell you he worked for the city? Yes, he said he had, he had worked with the city and county planning department. Oh, worked with the city? 
That's what. Oh, not work for the city. Work with. Yes. Okay, I understand. We're, going, we're talking about a conversation but from I, middle I, July I of this year. I just need to get a clarification. Work with and work for two different things for me. But I, I understand. Uh, does anyone else that wants to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare the public hearing to be closed. No one else asked to speak. As a matter of fact, before the council, recognize Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask uh, staff, uh, Scott King Road, is that, that is a state maintained road? Yes, Council Member Brown, that is a, a state maintained road. All right, so that makes it more problematic and. It, the MCDOT would have to approve any access to that road. Okay. Can you say that? Yeah, the, the MCDOT would have to approve any access to that, to Scott King Road. Okay. And what's your prediction in terms of t two factors? One would be time. I'll let someone from City Transportation answer that one. Uh, good evening, Wesley Parham, Assistant Director of Transportation. Um, I don't recall this specifically coming up during the preliminary review of the case, but my suspicion is that if DOT were to allow the connection, they would also require the construction of a left turn lane into the site. So it would not be just the uh, connection or the additional street connection, but also the associated cost with the widening for a left turn lane. I also recall there are sections along Scott King Road that have a lot of hills. We call them vertical curves. And those also may require more significant adjustments to Scott King Road to ensure proper sight distance for any intersection that may be extended out of the subdivision to the south. Um, so I cannot say that DOT would not allow it, but I'm certain that the, the cost of doing so is going to go beyond just simply tying a street in. It's going to require the additional improvements on Scott King Road to make appropriate sight distance provisions and for a left turn lane. Okay, so it would, what you're telling us is that it would be problematic uh, for to it's, get the, it's the gonna state's come approval and also costly? It's going to be costly. It's, there'll be costs associated with it, and it would still be subject to their concurrence to allow this to happen. Um, but I don't think it's imp impossible either. Okay, thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Um, I'd like to find out about the process of developers going into neighborhoods and having dialogue with community folks. Um, the statement was made that there's nothing binding about that. Is there any, can you tell me what the protocols are for the discussion, the dialogue, and any recommendation that may or may not come from the community? There are certain types of cases which do require the, the developer or applicant to hold a neighborhood meeting before submitting the case. Uh, typically larger rezonings or any amendment to the comprehensive plan. This is, at this point, this was only an annexation request, which does not require neighborhood meeting. What the applicant did was purely on his own. Uh, okay. Purely on his own. All right. Thank you. It, it, because it's a, su a conservation subdivision, does it not have to have a, a hearing? I mean, I'm sorry, a public meeting. Um, Steve Madlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Conservation subdivisions are actually an administrative evaluation and approval, which means that the application would review, be reviewed at the staff level and found to be technically compliant would be approved at that level. Are there other questions, comments on this item? Not entertain a motion on the item. Um, I move the staff's recommendation. Or do I have to be more explicit, Mr. Attorney? Do I need to say something else? T typically, you, you'd move the item that's in front of you. Okay. I move the item. It's, it's been brought to move and second. And just for clarification, Mr. Mayor, that would include a revision to the extension agreement to include the voluntary donation to the Durham Public Schools that the applicant offered. That's a part of our motion. You accept that? Yes. Second, accept that. Uh, is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Let's 16 consolidated annexation, Richmond Park. This item is three separate actions by the City Council related to the annexation of the Richmond Park development. There is a utility extension agreement that has been requested by Green Olive Investments to serve the development. 
uh, the Public Works Department has performed a utility impact analysis and determined that the adequate that adequate sewer and water capacity is available. A voluntary petition for contiguous annexation has also been submitted by the property owner for the site. The Budget Management Services Department has performed a fiscal impact analysis and determined that revenues will exceed expenditures immediately upon annexation. Pursuant to state law, the City Council is required to apply an initial zoning to the newly annexed property. Staff is recommending that initial zoning of RS-10 with a development plan for the subject property, which would permit up to single 16 single-family units. The staff recommends that the Council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for this site. Again, this is a public hearing. I will declare the public hearing to be open. I would ask first other questions or comments by members of the Council. If not, I have one person that has signed up to speak, uh, Michael Birch. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Uh, had, had you signed up? Pardon? Had you signed up? Okay, if you don't mind, if you could uh, go to the podium. And might I ask, are you in support or opposition to the? Okay, let's, let's start with the proponents. And again, if you take 10 minutes, and opponents have 10 minutes on the item. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor uh, and members of council, my name is Michael Birch with Morning Star Law Group in Durham. I'm here on behalf of the property owner and applicant, Green Olive Investments, LLC. Also with me tonight is Randy Miller of Thompson & Associates, the project engineer. So if there are any uh, technical questions, I'll try and defer those to the, to the expert. Uh, first, I want to thank staff and Scott in particular for getting us uh, to this point in the process. Uh, this project uh, was approved by the county in 2009. It was actually a 16 lot subdivision at that time uh, in the RS-10 district. Uh, what we're bringing forward today, uh, as a condition of that plan, it required annexation into the city. So that's the process we're going through now, annexation, the initial zoning, uh, and the development plan approval. This plan uh, is actually one lot less than the 16 lot subdivision that was approved by the county in 2009. So we're just, pro we're just proposing uh, 15 single family detached lots. Uh, the plan is carrying forward all of the committed elements that were agreed to and approved in 2009 as well. Uh, and that includes all of the transition areas, open space areas, setbacks, um, all of those things are being carried forward exactly as they were in the 2009 plan. Uh, and as staff noted, this request is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. I do want to note, uh, just in our conversations with some of the folks that live in the nearby area, I want to just touch on one topic in particular, and that's stormwater impacts. Uh, this site, because it's in the Jordan Lake area, is limited to 24% impervious surface. That includes uh, the new road that will be constructed as well as all of the residential lots. So we're restricted to 24% impervious. We are also controlling for the one, two, uh, and 10 year storm events. Uh, and through some additional analysis with staff during this process, we also did some analysis on the 100 year storm event. We are reducing the post development stormwater rates and volumes are all less uh, post development than they are pre development. That's for all those storm events, including the 100 year storm. What we're doing is Currently, there's a little drainage ditch that all the water from that whole site, including a portion of Grandale Road, drains across that site, comes into the ditch, and point discharges into a stream behind one of our adjacent property uh, owners' residences. Now, what we're doing is we're diverting all of our site and a portion of the drainage off of Grandale Road into our storm detention facility, putting it into a wet pond, detaining it for two to three days so after that first flush some infiltration will occur then and then as it draws down it will be sent over a 100 foot long level spreader some infiltration will occur there and it will then be sent across a 50 foot buffer adjacent to the stream so we're going to be reducing the amount of volume that's going to run into the stream we're going to be putting it over a longer area we're going to be putting it in over a much longer period of time at a much slower rate, reducing the stormwater impacts uh, both to our adjacent neighbor and downstream. And I just wanted to, to highlight that. That's something that, again, we spent a lot of time and analysis on throughout this process uh, in conjunction with the city's uh, 
stormwater and engineering division as well. Uh, if there are any technical questions, again, I'll, we have the uh, project engineer here to answer any questions you may have. So, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have one. person is speaking in opposition to this item. Uh, I recognize Mr. Robert Stewart. Is that correct? Robert Stewart? Do I have the wrong name here? Robert Sh Junk Stewart? Oh, okay. Uh, Richard Park and Matthew O. Wilson. Is that correct? Willis. Willis, okay. I'm sorry about that. Mr. Willis? <laughs> Again, let, let me ask, is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition to this item? I'm trying to, in opposition? All right. Um, the opposition has 10 minutes, uh, not 10 minutes each, but a total of 10. Thank you. Mr. Wilson? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you. Um, I've never been here before, so not quite sure or familiar with your procedures, but I'll do the best I can. Well, it looks like I, I haven't been here before either, the way I'm screwing these things up. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Well, I think you're probably more familiar with this than I am. Um, I'm the gentleman that Mr. Birch uh, referred to as uh, the concurrent homeowner. And I have spoken with Mr. Birch, and it has been, as far as I know, an amicable series of conversations. Um, I'm on the site plan. I assume all of you folks have this site plan that we're talking about here. And I'm where it says 52 M. It says M.B. Willis. I don't know where the B came from, but it's M.D. for David. Anyway, um, the ditch that Mr. Birch refers to, which I've walked through, runs contiguously. It's a naturally made-by-nature drainage ditch uh, that flows through the entire piece of property they're going to develop. And it's not a stream because it's not continuously flowing. It's only a drainage ditch when it rains. Um, oh, I assume most of us probably remember this past April where we had either 24 or 25 days of continuous rain out of 30 days in the month. Uh, that stream, that, that ditch became a, a river and it flowed so much that it actually encroached up into my backyard and caused me a great deal of alarm, shall we say. And I called the Grandale Homeowners Association because at the same time, which Mr. Birch and his people said to me, they're not responsible for the drainage on Sutteridge Court. There's a, you know, a drainage culvert which empties out into the same area where this ditch empties out into. And it's 48 inches. And that looked like a broken water main when, on some of those days where it was raining. And I understand the rules that Mr. Birch referred to that they talk about a one or two or five or ten or one hundred year event but they're only referring to one day and nature doesn't work that way nature works in a period of many days and as i said just a minute ago if we look at the past april it rained repeatedly over a series of days weeks in april and his storm analysis as far as the water is concerned only takes them into account, because he said that's all he's legally required to do, one day. Well, what happens if we have, which we will have, a repeat of what happened this past April? Does he in any way take that into account? As far as I understand, no. I asked him, he said no. So I don't think saying a one day, 100 year event is reality based. I think it's just a matter of whatever the rules are and that that's what he's using. And I understand that he's allowed to do that because those are the rules. But nature doesn't work on one day. Nature works in cycles. And as we all know, this past April, it rained for 24 or 25 days out of 30. And an awful lot more water than they're talking about went through that naturally occurring drainage ditch. And I don't think he's planned for that. That's number one. Number two. If you look on the very top of the, uh, of the, where it says traditional use area here, it was my understanding from a phone call with Mr. Birch both this morning and then several days ago 
that there would be a tree buffer zone where these other lots are. And now I was told this morning that there isn't going to be a tree buffer zone, and I think one of my neighbors will probably refer to this. But these are, this area is now, in effect, becoming the backyards of the houses that he's going to develop. And all the trees that are in there uh, on Stonehouse are going to be, well, could be cut down by the homeowners or by the developers, and there would be no trees left. So there'd be a fence basically separating the property from the existing neighbors, and then there'd be the other neighbors and no trees. And I refer to that for two reasons. Number one, you take housing that was the zone, the Grand Hill was developed in a certain way. There would be a lot of trees around Grand Hill, and a lot of those trees will now be removed, which will open up a lot of my neighbors' backyards into directly now into the new neighbors' backyards. And of course, everybody's entitled to have a place to live. So that removes the trees, but from my point of view, trees absorb water, and they're going to cut down all of these trees. So what's now a very heavily wooded area, which is the trees themselves are absorbing and stemming the flow of the water, and I'm not a hydrologist, but it's, it would seem to me as an average person, if you cut down most of the trees where all this water is flowing, isn't that going to increase the rate of water flow besides for the fact that all of my neighbors are now going to be staring into their neighbors' backyards with no trees blocking them? There's no buffer left anymore? I mean, can't there be a way to leave some of these trees which would serve multiple purposes of screening houses, neighbor houses from other houses and also s slowing the rate of water that would flow out? Seems to me there ought to be a way to do that. So my concerns are twofold. And last on that matter, and last but not least, Mr. Birch said they're going to put a water pond, a retention pond, which is, as you can see on this map, literally right next to me. Um, it's my understanding that it takes insects 24 to 48 hours to breed. Mr. Birch told me that the retention pond would let the water out over a period of three days, which means it seems to me there's going to be an awful lot more insect life in right where I live and where other families live and children live. Is there any way to put some kind of a spray device or something into the pond to alleviate that? I mean, nobody wants to live next to a pond that's uh, where basically stagnant water where you have all kinds of bugs breeding. That's going to create a public health hazard. So I have several reasons to object to this. I'm not in any way opposed to more housing being put in. Please do not misunderstand me. Everyone needs a place to live. And everybody is certainly entitled to move into a nice new house. But it seems to me there should be ways to develop a property that take into the concerns the existing property that's already there. That's my point. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. You're welcome. Um, again, we had 10 minutes in opposition. Opponents, um, Mr. Cheney, uh, you have three minutes left on this time. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Charles Cheney, H. Stonehouse Court. I live uh, in one of the middle lots, uh, which would be north of the new development. And Mr. Willis, in, in point number two, addressed uh, my concern was uh, when I first uh, bought the property uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, just in general conversation, that uh, my understanding that there would be a buffer, such as we have uh, in Grandale, we have the setback and then the, the buffer, which would, would supply some trees, which is consistent, as Mr. Willis said, with the overall environmental you know, uh, picture of the situation. Uh, when I got this map in the mail, I noticed that there was no buffer identified here, trees, and then on the south side, it apparently was a 40-foot buffer. My question was just, you know, you know why is this situation. Could it be split 20 and 20, something like that, to provide that, that buffer situation? So Mr. Willis has already discussed that. Uh, it was just a concern as a property owner uh, looking uh, out of my deck straight into the yard. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would ask the opponent if you have comments. 
relative to what you've heard. And do you have his time? Six minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do want to touch on the two points, uh, both the stormwater and the tree buffer transition issue. Um, first, with regard to the stormwater, um, the stream or the ditch that's on site, the portion of that stream that is a buffered stream is being buffered pursuant to the regulations, 50 foot on each side, top of bank, uh, with an additional 10 foot no build outside of that. Again, we don't have the lot that we removed from the 2009 plan to this plan was one of the lots that had a portion of that buffer area within it. We took that away, and so we don't have any buildable lots even near that, excuse me, even near that uh, buffered stream. Uh, the closest thing to that buffered stream is the stormwater detention facility, again, which is diffusing the flow and not point discharging like it has been uh, and is currently in its undeveloped state. I, I want to reiterate that this development will have no impact on the adjacent property from a stormwater standpoint for up to the 100-year storm. Um, that is certainly above and beyond what the 2009 plan did. Uh, I believe that was only up to the 10-year storm, maybe possibly the 20-year storm. This goes above and beyond that up to the 100-year storm. With regard to the location of the stormwater detention facility, there's really one place where we can put it, and that's the low point of the site. That pond is located approximately uh, 250 to 300 feet from our adjacent property's property line. There's another at least 50 feet on his side before he gets to the residence. So we're talking about, about 300, 350 feet from a distance standpoint. The two to three day drainage period is really for those larger storm events. The amount of time that it takes to get from being able to capture and detain all of that water for that t time period to drain down for the, really for those larger storm events. In order to detain for the 100 year storm, um, we have to size the pond appropriately. And so that's going to drive the size and location of the pond. And so in order to do all of the downstream protection uh, and detention that we're doing, it's got to be sized uh, and it's got to have that drainage period to accommodate that water. With regard to the tree buffer issue along the northern property line, again, just going back to the 2009 plan and the committed elements, um, there was never a tree buffer along our northern property line. Uh, those tree buffers are driven by zoning uh, and the zoning of adjacent properties. So we do have a 40-foot tree buffer area along our southern property line because we're transitioning to an area that's zoned less intense. The uh, subdivision to our direct north is of a similar intensity as ours. Uh, so we do not have that tree buffer on our side. However, when their development came through, I believe in 2005, four or five, this property that we're talking about today was zoned rural residential. So they have a 50 foot wide tree buffer area along the backs of their property. Nothing that we're doing today will impact that 50 foot buffer. Now, within that 50 foot buffer, they do have a drainage area that may prevent the location of trees there, but there's 15 feet on either side of that 20 foot drainage buffer, all along property that they control um, that is tree safe area and that is wooded and that will serve as a buffer. Uh, with that 50 foot and the 25 foot building setback on our property, we'll have a minimum 75 feet of separation between structures. And I want to point out that the transition that we're providing to our north uh, from our setback standpoint is the same transitions that are provided within that subdivision when houses within that subdivision back up to each other. They provide the same, I believe it's actually a 20 foot setback uh, minimum. So uh, again, I understand that potentially when they bought this property that it wasn't developed, um, but it's all, this property has always been planned to develop. There's certainly been an approved development plan on this property since 2009, and I want to reiterate that plan did not include any additional buffer area on this property. So um, uh, I believe with that, I have to answer any additional questions. Any questions by counsel? If not, uh, no, uh, you have one, we have one other person that had signed up and he's got a, how much time? Two minutes. Two minutes. 
uh, Bill Hunt. Is Bill Hunt present? It's not you have uh, two minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me to speak, um, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I want to support the gentleman here and what he had to say. Um, I sort of live downstream from where this is taking place, and we have a lot of problems with uh, these events, with flooding. My house is closer to the Army Corps of Engineers, and the water tends to really back up under certain conditions. Um, it is a fact, if you check with the people that deal with water resource management of the state, uh, my son works for uh, North Carolina State and consults on a number of these issues, that when you remove the trees, you are basically creating more of a problem. You're going to create more of a drainage problem. It's going to be more water flowing. Um, I also want to comment on the gentleman's comment about um, rain occurring on a specific day. He is correct that when you look at a one in a 100 year event, you can get clusters, and he gave a very good example of a series of clusters that were occurring in April. And there are equivalencies. You can get multiple days with a lot of rainfall that's gonna be comparable to a one in a 100 year flood, and the regulations are really not designed to address those, those considerations. So <clears throat> that's essentially what I have to say. I would appreciate it if you would use the, your combined wisdom to consider these things when it comes to approving um, this kind of ch zoning change when it can impact the people that are already there. And as I said, I live downstream from this and really don't want to see a whole lot more water flowing into my backyard. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I need to make sure I'm looking at the correct map is the one that we have in our uh, tablet correct I'm trying to make make sure I understand another map that he was talking about versus yeah. this map that I have which Mi shows tree lines mr. mayor the map that's in your packet is what's associated with the development plan which is what would be approved if the council adopts the initial zoning I think what the folks in the audience may be referencing is the site plan that's under review as a separate administrative process which is not in your packet That, that's, that's a question, and we, what, what we've been asked to do this, this evening is, one, to annex some property. That's, that's the first order of business, and uh, our process is that if we, and this is voluntary annexation, if we annex a piece of property into the city, uh, then there's an initial zoning that we can place on it. I think we have up to 60 days once it's been annexed. If we annex it, effective 31st of December, then we have up to 60 days to put the zoning on that property. And as I understand what the staff has, you want us to, if we annex it, to accept this zoning, which is R10 with a development plan? Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And then the details that the gentleman was speaking about, that comes later when the site plan is actually? Yes, so a lot of those details would be worked out under the site plan review process. However, that would be an administrative process, would not require a any additional city council public hearing. So can, can you comment on uh, some of the concerns that have been raised by the propo opponents relative to the tree line? I, I understand the water issue, the size of the pond, et cetera. So when this development plan was originally approved in the by the county commissioners, the applicant did show all the required buffers uh, per the Unified Development Ordinance. The lots to the south and to the east are zoned rural residential, which there is a required buffer in between the RS10 zoning district and the RR zoning district. The, the Grandale lots are zoned PDR, planned development residential. There is no required boundary buffer between RS10 and those lots because they tend to have a similar types of use and lot size. So what, uh, what the applicant is doing is com fully compliant with the, our ordinance. And there are no buffers shown to the west and to the north. So if the developer or the applicant uh, were to receive this R10 D zoning that we have before us, and then when you went into the details of how he's actually going to lay out the lots, 
uh, he could remove all the trees that the our opponents are concerned about? It's, it is legally permissible for the, the developer to do that. They would have to have at least 20% tree preservation for the entire site, but uh, there's no requirement to where exactly that is. Does, does the developer have any comments on that? Is it your intent to remove the trees that the opponents have a concern about? Sir, the, the plan that you all have before you may have the building envelope there. I mean, that, that's a, an allowable building envelope I don't think there's the intention to need to go out beyond that. That's just what's beyond that building envelope is, is kind of someone's backyard. Again, I'm not sure exactly what version of the plan you're looking at, whether there's that allowable building envelope there. But okay, the 25-foot the, the building setback, again, is not needed at all for building placement or anything. I, I do have a concern about uh, runoff, and mm -hmm. I, I understand to a certain extent, our, our hands are tired, but you know, I would hope that uh, in in the development that what the developer does is to try to be as constructive as possible to minimizing uh, excess runoff from their property onto others. And if there's a way to do that with this particular development, uh, especially as it pertains to the trees, I somehow feel more comfortable with that. Now, I, I know that's an administrative issue, and I'm trying to understand from the staff, do you have any comments relative to that? Steve? Could you answer that, please? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I understand it. We, we take care of that. Thank you. Steve, I, my, my concern is that, uh, and I notice it's an administrative issue relative to what the final layout of the lots will be. But my concern is, is in any way that we have some kind of assurance that uh, we minimize the removal of trees as has been expressed by the opponents of this on, in this particular development. We don't have this building envelope that the developer talked about, so I, I don't really know what he's talking about. Actually, you do. It's well, where, on where sheet it? two of the development plan. It's uh, where? It, yeah. tell, tell me where, which one it is. And um, it would be sheet two of the development plan. It actually shows building envelopes. This should be in your package of the development plan. Uh, well, maybe page three on yours. I apologize. I have a paper copy. Um, Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, obviously, if it is the desire of council and if the applicant were so amenable, uh, they do have the ability, because this is a development plan zoning, to be able to proffer additional committed elements, which means they could proffer to retain existing vegetation along that property line if they so chose to do so. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor, uh, if I could, oh, sorry. Just, just, just a minute. Uh, I've heard the staff comment. Before you respond, I see a couple of my colleagues have some comments. I recognize Councilwoman. To, I want to ask Long. staff, um, on the development plan, on the north side, and I, I don't know where the property line is in the development plan, but there's a 50-foot transitional use area with a 20-foot right. drainage easement. Wh which, where is that? Is that a public easement? Does it belong to the okay. applicant? The 50-foot transitional use area is actually within the adjacent subdivision. It is not a buffer, and I know that it has been referred to as a buffer this evening. It is actually just an area that was a component of the Unified Development Ordinance uh, requirements for plan density residential districts, which basically said that you could only do in that transitional use area like types of uses that were permissible on the opposite side of that property line, and you would have to meet the same mirror setback. So in essence, because this property at the time was zoned uh, probably RR, they would be allowed to bring all residential units within 25 feet of that property line as long as it did not encroach into any storm drainage easements. Uh, um, I, I, I'm a little confused. So tell me, the transitional use area belongs to the individual homeowners who live on the adjacent that, on Stonehouse? Uh, that is correct. And um, when I look at an aerial photo uh, of the area I see the houses on Stonehouse have mostly removed a lot of their vegetation. I, and so I'm going to ask, you're a resident of Stonehouse? Are you a resident of Stonehouse? Um, let me ask you, you can just nod your head. On st where you live, 
have you removed the vegetation back to the edge of the transitional use area? Is there 50 feet left that's vegetated on your property? Oh, okay, there's there's a outside of your yard proper. There's a 50 foot transitional area. That no, mm -mm. no, the transitional use area actually encompasses portions of their lots. I don't have a problem if you if if you can speak to Councilman Moffitt's area. Right. Who can respond to that? They do have. Well, who are going to respond to come to the podium? And they do. I, I have a question for the applicant. Um, are you planning the mass grade or? No, no, there should be a note on the plan sheet that says each lot will be graded. Okay. So outside of the building, one of the things that you could do that would help us move along, mm -hmm. I think, is that um, outside of the building envelope, um, you could commit to uh, leaving the vegetation intact on the north side of the building envelopes. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I'm not recommending that, right. or it would be a proffer that you would make if right. you were. That, that's something I'll talk to the client about, the property owner about. One thing I do want to note, just I want to make sure, I know there's two types of items that we're talking about here, these trees, both with regard to kind of a transition screening standpoint, but also just from a stormwater impact standpoint. I want to note that the pond and everything and all these stormwater calculations and still detaining for that 100 year storm will take into account all of that site work that's done as a part of the development. So I don't want there to be an impression that by removing a tree that we're somehow not accounting for the lack of infiltration that may be associated with that disturbance. Again, that the site disturbance is being considered when doing the stormwater calculations on the site permits further down the road. Again, from a transition standpoint, I, you know, screening standpoint, I'll understand and I'll talk to the property owner about that. It, I'm sorry, it's the property owner yes, here? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. I'll see. Uh, are you and Steve together on, I mean, did you have a question also? Okay. I mean, Don, I said Don. Uh, Councilman Moffitt wants to you respond, that's up to him. I, I, I'm satisfied with the information I have at the moment. Okay. Are, are you going to uh, respond? Sir, Mr. Mayor and Council, we'll, we can commit at this point to, again, to kind of an undisturbed tree buffer area of 10 feet on our side of the north, our common property line with the subdivision to the north. Um, Again, the, the area kind of on the north side, again, even though it's not a buffer area, I know there's a storm drainage. I think there is still, there is a fence there. There's an existing uh, fence between the properties there, so. Steve, did you hear that? Yes, sir. Um, I have recorded that the applicant has proffered for council's consideration a uh, preservation of a 10-foot wide tree coverage area adjacent to the northern property line. Okay. Are, are there further questions from by the council in any in direction? If, if not, uh, I, I'm going to close the public hearing, which I thought I had done, but closing the public hearing on this matter is now back before the council and entertain a motion on an item. Move the item, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, further questions, discussion on item? No further questions, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Yes. Yes. No further questions, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Sure. I, I sense a, a good deal of frustration in the audience from some of the property owners, and I think uh, many of us have served on a joint city county planning committee or worked on the development of the UDO. I've been on this council for 10 years, and we do quite often have very controversial rezonings.
but generally residential to residential is not particularly controversial and particularly when you have the exact same density or development next to it. So I, I actually think that the um, proffer from the applicant in that case was um, generous and appropriate, but I just want you to know that we are, we do consider these things carefully. Um, and I think that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Let's move to item 17, consolidated annexation, RTP Global Mission Church, BDG 13000016. This item is three separate actions by the City Council related to the annexation of the RTP Global Mission Church site. A utility extension agreement has been requested by RTP Global Mission Church to serve the development. Public Works, the Public Works Department has performed a utility impact analysis and determined that adequate sewer and water capacity is available. A voluntary petition for a contiguous annexation has also been submitted by the property owner. The Budget Management Services Department performed a physical impact analysis and determined that revenues will exceed expenditures on the second year after build out. The City Council is required to apply an initial zoning to the newly annexed property, property and staff is recommending an initial zoning of industrial light or IL, which would permit the proposed place of worship by right. The staff recommends that the council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for RTP Global Mission Church. Thank you. This is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report. The public hearing is open. I would ask first of the questions, comments by members of the council. Uh, if not, we have one person that has signed up to speak as a proponent of this item. Let me ask of the other persons who might want to speak as proponents. Does anyone want to speak as an opponent? An opponent? If not, uh, I'm having problems reading, reading the name. It's two level two. All right, if you can come to the podium and uh, pronounce your name again, please, for me. And since we don't have any other persons speaking on this item, if you could limit your comments to three minutes initially. Okay, so uh, my name is Stephen Park. I'm one of the members of RTP Global Mission Church. I'm here to represent um, our congregation along with Pastor Lee uh, in the audience. So I have nothing more to add to the uh, agenda. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, hopefully this is a boring case. Thank you. Let me ask other questions of the proponent by the council. Recognize Council Moffitt. Is that correct? I'm sorry, not the proponent. I have a question for staff. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm not able to get my connection here. Um, I worked on this on an adjacent property rezoning when I was on the planning commission. My recollection of this site is that it's fairly steeply sloped down, running down to a stream. Is, am I recollecting it wrong? I know there is an adjacent stream and I believe there are some slopes. Okay. Is so, that it? I guess. Um, yes, that's it. Uh, does anyone else want to speak on this item either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else has to speak on this item either for or against. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, before the council. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. You passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Move to item 18, consolidated annexation, Grover Yancey annexation, BDG 13 -0 -0 -0 -0 -0 -0 -0 this item is three separate actions by City Council related to the annexation of the Grover Yancey site. A utility extension agreement has been requested by the property owner Grover Yancey to serve the development. The Public Works Department has performed a utility impact analysis and determined that adequate sewer and water capacity is available. A voluntary petition for non-contiguous annexation has been submitted by the property owner. The Budget Management Services Department has performed a physical impact analysis and determined that Revenues will exceed expenditures immediately upon annexation. The City Council is required to apply an initial zoning to the newly annexed property and staff is re recommending an initial zoning of RS-20, which, which would allow the development of one single family unit on the property. So the staff recommends that the Council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation and initial zoning of the Grover Yancey site. Uh, you've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask for their comments by members of the council on this item, from the staff. Uh, there's one person that signed up to speak on this item, uh, Cuff 
Cradle. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to speak on this? Cliff Cradle, okay. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on this item before or against? No, I'd recognize Mr. Cradle. You have three minutes. Uh, I want to thank you all, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, for uh, taking a look at this this evening. Uh, this is a single family residential lot. Um, it's just on the border of the city limits. And they did try to get uh, water and sewer on the site, but it's just not big enough to accommodate uh, where it is. That's why they're asking for annexation for the utilities for this single family lot and older subdivision. And I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Are there questions by members of the council? Is anyone else that wants to speak on this item that's being a public hearing? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Move the item. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Move to item 19. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Move to item 19, consolidated annexation, changing hearts for changing lives, BDG 13000017. This item is three separate actions by city council related to the annexation of the changing hearts for changing lives site. A utility extension agreement has been requested by Changing Hearts for Changing Lives to serve the development. The Public Works Department has performed a utility impact analysis and determined that adequate sewer and water capacity is available. A voluntary petition for contiguous annexation has also been submitted by the property owner for the site. The Budget Management Services Department did perform a physical impact analysis and for the proposed use of the site as a place of worship and that determined that estimated revenues would not exceed estimated expenditures within the 10-year analysis time frame. Uh, please note that the annexation would be effective on December 31st, 2013, which is a correction to uh, the motion in your packet. The City Council is required to apply initial zoning to the newly annexed property. Staff is recommending an initial zoning of rural residential or RR, which would permit the place of worship use, subject to approval by the, a minor special use permit by the Board of Adjustment. The staff recommends that the council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for the Changing Hearts for Changing Lives site. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Any comments from the council? I recognize Councilwoman Katati and Councilwoman, Councilman Moffitt in that order. Oops. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is really a question for staff. There is no development plan on this. What do we know about the possible location of entryways and... I mean, there's no envelope. What can you tell us? There is no envelope. There is a associated site plan under review, and uh, any driveways would have to be approved by the North Carolina Department of Transportation because all the adjacent roadways are outside the city limits. Uh, my question for staff is, I, I thought I heard you say that you were recommending initial RR zoning and it would prevent a place of worship. Is that what I heard? The, the RR zoning would allow a place of worship, but only if the Board of Adjustment approved a minor special use permit. Right. Okay, and I have one further question. Does, on all these consolidated annexation cases, does the Planning Commission hear any of these zoning recommendations? The, back in 2005, the Planning Commission passed a resolution uh, recommending approval of any initial zoning if it were the same zoning that were already existing in the county. So the Planning Commission doesn't hear it, but it is technically recommended there's a recommendation for approval by the Planning Commission. This is a public hearing. We have uh, David Johnson. I didn't indicate, are you a proponent or opponent? All right, well, we'll leave you back for a minute. Um, I have, is anyone else who wants to speak in support of this item, in support of it? Okay, we have two persons that have signed up to speak, David Johnson, who, who's undecided, so I'll call on somebody who is decided. Uh, Kevin Tiggin, Tiggin, is that it? Who's an opponent? That's Cradle, he's already spoken. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm tired from, the, I don't know how you do this every, every month or what. Um, Try twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I've, I've just got questions. Um, they want to be zoned into the city so they can get city services like water and sewer. My first question is who's going to pay for the sewer? Is the city going to pay for it? Are they going to pay for it? Because I think they got to dig up all the medallion drive. And uh, then... Wanna... The, the applicant is required for all to pay for all sewer and water improvements that are associated with this development, not the city. I just didn't want that to, just didn't want that to be charged to the city. Uh, I just uh, moved just, here. I, mean, I, I think that's a fair question because we, we're going through annexations, which we don't have a lot of. It's just not water and sewer. Uh, once they are part of the city, they get whatever services the city provides. So, and they pay city taxes uh, in addition to county taxes also. Um, Mr. Cradle, you're in support of it. Do you have any comments to make before I call on Mr. Johnson? Yeah. I'll answer any questions. Um, this is a uh, residentially zoned uh, property that's currently in the county. It's uh, three parcels that are being recombined into one for a place of worship. The land that the place of worship is being proposed is not really conducive to septic and um, well, and it's also approximately 80 feet from the existing sewer line and also has water existing on both frontages of Medallion and, and Cheek Road. Uh, for that, we're, that's the reason we're asking for annexation to extend those um, utilities to the site. Thank you. Uh, Mr. David Johnson. We're operating on three minutes on these, Madam Clerk. Well, thank you for listening to me. The uh, reason I'm not sure, we've not seen a plan of what the, where it's going to be put there or how it's going to be. If it's uh, RR, I would assume, I don't know a lot about it, but residential, rural residential, seems more like houses unless there's an exception there will be a church. Uh, I don't have a problem with the church going there, but if it's, it'll, it's going to stay as a church, that's fine. Uh, but no one that I know has seen any plans or exactly where the layout's going to be or anything of that nature. It's all mostly in that area, the Medallion Drive area, and all was mostly retired elderly people. Uh, if you've got sewers coming across their property, I'm sure at some point in time someone has to pay something for it being across their property. Uh, and this is the biggest concern. I'll let the staff respond to that, um, if you don't mind. Certainly. Uh, the, uh, the place of worship use would have to be approved by the Board of Adjustment at a uh, public hearing. So all neighbors within 300 feet of this site would be notified of the public hearing. And as part of that, uh, that process, there are a number of findings that are adopted in the ordinance that the board must consider, such as traffic and circulation and impact on adjacent properties and property values. Uh, should the special use permit not be approved, then the site would be allowed to develop under the ex existing zoning, which would be some fairly low density residential similar to what's developed around it. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Uh, anybody, else, anybody else want to uh, speak on this item before I close the public hearing? Mr. Mayor, Recognize. That gentleman there had one more question. Well, I, I'm giving an opportunity now if he wants to speak. <laughs> he, 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 sort of he sort of answered it. It was about the, uh, the street and the, how many people would be going up and down the street. And, and then um, I also had some uh, questions about the uh, the stream. It's a stream running on the back of this property. It's kind of wet back there. I don't know if uh, they maybe thought about maybe moving the stream, um, some buffers, you know, uh, something to control the water, mm -hmm. um, retention respond. ponds. There are several regulated streams on this site, and regardless of what's built on there, then uh, a buffer of at least 50 feet and oftentimes 100 feet would be required. Oh, okay. Yeah, as well as some any stormwater improvements that are required by the city stormwater ordinance. I, I, I think I need to work with them because my property is right, right next to it, and it drains right into their property. So, so. Is there anyone else that wants to speak? I'm doing a little bit different on this public hearing because I, I realize you don't come here all the time, and I, I'm sure you have some concerns, and we want to try to make sure we can answer as many questions as we can. 
in the realm of which we do conduct public hearings. Anyone else that wants to speak on this item, comments or not? If not, I'm going to let the record reflect no one else has to speak. I'll uh, close the public hearing in Mattis back before the council. <coughs> it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Move to item 20, comprehensive plan amendment, Page Park 2A13000016. Six. Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, before you tonight, as the mayor said, is case A13006, which is Page Park 2. The applicant is Lenar Carolinas, and they are requesting a, an amendment to the uh, future land use map of the comprehensive plan uh, to change the future land use designation of an approximately 10-acre parcel from its existing designation of office to medium density residential, uh, which would accommodate the uh, associated zoning case, which is the next item on your agenda. Uh, staff, fi staff finds that this request is, uh, provides an appropriate transition from the planned industrial and commercial uses uh, to the east uh, and from the resident lower density residential uses to the north um, and would be appropriate for the site and recommends approval. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval at its meeting unanimously on October 8, 2013 by a vote of 11 to 0. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Uh, I have one person that's signed up to speak as a proponent. I would ask other questions by members of the council first. If not, recognize uh, Robert Stewart. Uh, Robert Sh Shunk. 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 Of Stewart Engineering, is that it? Yes, uh, good evening. It's Robert Shunk with Stewart. Uh, I live at uh, 2627 University Drive here in Durham, uh, representing L Lenar Carolinas. I uh, agree with all the staff has uh, said about the case so far, and I can be available for any comments and questions you might have. All right, thank you. Any other persons that want to speak on this item? Other questions by counsel of the proponent? Hearing none, let, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. I declare the public going to be closed, Madam Clerk, for counsel. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? <coughs> Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Moved to item 21, zoning map change, page park 2Z13007. Good evening again, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, the case before you, Page Park 2, is an application by Lenar Carolinas uh, to request a change to the zoning designation of a 16.87 acre parcel, which includes the uh, property that was uh, included in the last action, located on Jessup Street near uh, Crown Parkway and west of Page Road. Uh, and the request is to change the zoning designation from residential suburban multifamily with the development plan and office institutional with the development plan to residential suburban multifamily with the development plan. Uh, if approved, the request before you tonight would allow for the development of a maximum of 124 residential units. Uh, this request is consistent with the future land use map designation based on the action you uh, took previously this evening. There are a number of text, graphic, and design commitments associated with this request, which are detailed in your staff report included in the agenda package. Uh, staff has determined that this request is consistent with the uh, comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances and the Planning Commission recommended approval of the item at their October 8, 2013 meeting by a vote of 11 to 0. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Let me ask other questions by members of the council. Uh, we have one person that has signed up to speak on this item. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Mayor, uh, City Council. Again, Robert Schunk, 2627 University Drive. Uh, I can make myself available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there questions of the proponent. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wanted to note that this is zoning change is projected to add 20 students to population of Durham Public School above the current zoning. Would the applicant be willing to proffer a contribution of $500 per student uh, for those 20 students to Durham Public Schools? Uh, and I'll make one clarification for you, Mr. Shule. Um, the unit count uh, that's proposed is, is if we were to do apartments. Uh, there was no commitment to do uh, townhomes for what we're proposing. In talking with uh, Scott Whiteman with the planning staff, the, uh, the increase of students would be less than that. But to your point, we'd be willing to uh, contribute $500 per additional student for the zoning request. And, and then how would that be then computed? Because the way we have it computed is right here in front of us. So maybe staff can help me with that. or. Uh so what I would recommend, unless there's a commitment to the type of use, we would certainly recommend council consider 
the maximum possible use, which as you alluded to, is apartments. Would you be willing to proffer that uh, $500 per student times 20 students? We, we would be willing to proffer it uh, for the additional students that we're proposing for. And I think we, we've worked with staff before at the time of site plan approval that the amount of students that we would be uh, adding would be evaluated at site plan. And then at the time of uh, building permit or final plat, whatever the trigger is, we would pay for those additional students at that time. We have a site plan already in process for a, uh, a townhome development. Is that customary or, uh, or occasionally occur? I'm not aware of a precedent for it, but it's conceptually possible and legal if you wish to accept it. Yeah, we did it for South Point Trails. So it is precedented once. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> There is a site plan under review that reflects townhomes. That's not committed, but if, um, if that continues forward, we can certainly enforce it the way Mr. Schunk explained. We can easily commit to doing townhomes, Mr. Schull. Thank you. If, 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 I'm sorry, Steve? Is that a commitment? If, if he would, to Steve's point earlier to me this morning, if he would like me to commit to it, I, I will upon his request. So many Steves here, Mr. Shunk. <laughs> For it to be a voluntary proffer, the applicant needs to make that proffer. Um, I think Council Member Schull has simply pointed out that he has concerns that this project may create an impact on the school system and is simply asking the applicant what they would do to offset those concerns. Does that, is, is there an answer? I, I'm, I'm like, who, Steve? We will make a $500 contribution for I each increase of students we're proposing. Uh, the, we've heard the proffer. Uh, are there other questions, comments by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I'm sorry, I'm not asking for anything, but I thought I heard you also proffer that they would, that you would build townhomes here. Uh, I no, no, no. I just I heard you say we could easily commit to it, and if you're not committing to it, that's fine. I just want to know what I, you're committing to. I was to not what proposing to, but if you would, if you ask me to, I'm I, not asking I, you to do anything. I'm asking you what you committed to. I, 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 I'm telling you what I heard, and I'm just asking you to clarify. We're committing to doing the $500 per additional student. Okay. Ask Councilwoman Gattani. I appreciate that. So I think the projection, as staff mentioned, was 20 students if it was apartments. What would the number of, what is the estimated number of additional students if there are townhomes? So we, we don't have those generation rates with us tonight. It's slightly less. Okay. Uh, very slightly. I would, pr I would estimate kind of 15 to 17 okay. range. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, rather than commit to a particular use, I'm comfortable with the, um, suggestion that they would use the calculations by staff at the time of site plan, but it was helpful to know what the scale was there. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Uh, anyone else from the public that wants to speak on this item? I, I recognize Councilman Shule. I have a question. Uh, on page eight of the memo, the staff report, the impervious surface maximum in that chart what does it mean when it says an impervious surface maximum of 100%? Can you explain to me what that means? Sure. Uh, Councilman Schill, what that refers to is the fact that there's no uh, mandated impervious surface limitation. So you could hypothetically get up to 100% uh, impervious surface covered. You would still have to treat your stormwater, so you really couldn't get to 100. But there's no legal restriction as there is in much of the city and county on the maximum impervious surface. And why is that? Explain that to me. Because of its location, uh, the location of this site, um, I believe, um, and maybe staff, I, I saw Rob Joyner or Scott Whiteman can assist me with this, I, I believe it's because of the fact that this is in a Crabtree Creek Basin that uh, doesn't drain directly to a water supply watershed, and therefore the, the state mandated uh, and local restrictions are, are lesser. Yeah. Any further questions, comments? If not, Public hearing is closed. Matters back before the council. 
It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Moved item 22, comprehensive plan amendment, Murrayfield Commercial A12000015. Uh, good evening again. Mirfield Commercial is a uh, application by Horbath Associates uh, for to modify the future land use designation uh, of the comprehensive plan on a 1.85 acre site uh, on the east side of Guest Road, just north of Horton Road and, and south of Victory Boulevard, from its existing designation of low density, medium res density residential to commercial. Uh, and this would uh, facilitate the zoning request, which is the next item on your agenda tonight. Um, staff recommends approval based on the four criteria for review of site plan, or excuse me, for a review of comprehensive plan amendments and uh, planning commission recommended approval unanimously at its October 8th, 2013 meeting by a vote of 11 to zero. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask council members if you have questions of the staff on the presentation. Uh, if not, we'll go to the public. We have, uh, Ron Harvard, speak on this item. Does anyone else who wants to speak on this item? Uh, if not, Ron, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, Ron Horvath, representing uh, Tycon in this matter. This is a uh, clarification to correct the plan, uh, future land use plan. The commercial or property was a zoned commercial a number of years ago, but at that time we were not updating the land use plan. Ask uh, your indulgence in this and approval, and we'll answer any questions. Thank you. You heard the proponent or the questions of the proponent by council members. I recognize Council Mamot. Uh, I have a question for staff. I just want to, Mr. Horvath has characterized this as a technical correction. Would you agree? I think I would agree in concept. It, it wasn't practice in 2003 to amend the comprehensive plan every time the zoning map was changed. So the zoning map was changed in a manner in 2003 that was inconsistent with the comp plan. So it's, it reconciles the comp plan with the zoning. Thank you. Just Any other questions, comments? Anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the rector reflect. No one in the public asks to speak beyond the proponent. Uh, the clerk of public hearing is closed. The matter is back before the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Move to item 23, zoning map change, Murrayfield Commercial Z12000026. Uh, good evening again. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, Murrayfield Commercial is a request by Horvath Associates, Associates to change the zoning designation of an approximately 2.95 acre parcel located at 1439 Victory Boulevard, which is north of Horton Road and south of Prison Camp Road, uh, from its existing designation of commercial neighborhood, or CN, with a development plan. Uh, to commercial neighborhood or seeing with a development plan uh, with, with different commitments. Uh, this was originally zoned in 2003, as was discussed briefly in the last case, um, and there are three ways that the, what's being requested deviates from the existing development plan. Uh, what's before you tonight would allow an increase in the amount of non-residential development from 5,000 square feet to 8,000 square feet. Uh, it modifies the uh, site access points, and it changes the committed uses to allow a mix of office, retail, and restaurant uses without a drive-through, um, the previous zoning limited uses to office or retail or a restaurant. Uh, this request is consistent with the future land use designation of the comprehensive pl plan based on the action you just took at the previous item. Uh, there are a number of text, graphic, and design commitments associated with this request, which are outlined uh, in the staff report included in your agenda package. Um, and Planning Commission recommended approval on, uh, on October 8, 2013 by a vote of 11 to 0. Be happy to take any questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Any questions by members of the council? Uh, the proponent, Ron Harvard. Thank you. Once again, Mayor, members of council, Ron Horvath. Uh, one item I wanted to bring out, the main change for this zoning was to eliminate two driveway connections across a stream to the rear of the property and uh, provided access through the residential development that is behind this uh, commercial piece. We've moved that access point out onto Victory Boulevard and eliminated the two stream crossings and the neighborhood access. I ask your approval of this and available for any questions. Thank you. Are there questions of the proponent? Recognize Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, uh, my uh, site plan or development plan is not coming up, but perhaps staff or the applicant could clarify the off-site 
um, trail, Warren Creek Trail thing. I can't get the picture up, but um, there There's is a, a graphic commitment, and I'm assuming that's a binding commitment. All graphic c commitments are binding. I'm, I'm trying to find the, my, own co my copy for reference also. Okay. The applicant's certainly welcome to speak to it. Well, you're going to have to help me on that one, Pat. I believe that went back to 2003, Diane, when uh, there was a commitment to provide a easement for a trail through Warren Creek, which is on the southern side of this property next to the commercial. We still have no problem with that. It's okay. all in floodplain. So uh, there is a commitment on the adjacent property, which is not part of the action tonight. It's associated, I think, with this proposed development, but it's not part of the action before you. It would, st as the applicant alluded to, would stay a commitment from the 2003 action as an easement dedication. Any other questions, comments? Uh, any other comments from the public? Uh, let the record reflect no one else in the public wanted to speak. The public hearing is closed. As a matter of fact, put counsel. Move, move on. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7-0. Move to item 24. Zoning map change, Hudson property, Z13-00010. Uh, good evening, uh, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. The Hudson property uh, is a request to change the zoning designation of a 7.99 acre parcel located at 117 East NC 54 Highway, east of Fayetteville Road and west of Interstate 40 from its current zoning designation of residential suburban 20 to office institutional with a development plan. And if approved, uh, the action before you would allow for a maximum of 150,000 square feet of office space. Um, there are text graphic and design commitments associated with this request detailed in your staff report and your agenda package. These include transit and roadway improvements, including uh, dedication and development of a four foot wide bicycle lane, as well as design commitments. Uh, staff determines this request is consistent with a comprehensive plan designation for the property. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval of the item at its September 10, 2013 meeting by a vote of 11 to 0. I'll be happy to take any questions. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Are there questions of the staff by the council? Uh, if not, uh, we have one person signed up to speak on this item, Bob Zulwalt. Zulwalt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, Bob Zumwalt with McAdams, uh, here representing Davis Moore Capital. I've got Earl Llewellyn from Kimley Horn and Austin Kuhn as well, and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there questions of the proponent by recognize yeah. Councilman Shule? Mr. Mayor, I guess this is actually for the staff, which is, is uh, if that's appropriate, uh, just the, the addition of 5,400 trips per day to already overcrowded roads, do we have any problem with that? Uh, I'll ask Wesley Perrin with the Transportation Par uh, Department to address that concern. No, sir, we do not see any additional problems with that. Well, explain why not. I mean, it looks like we're already over the... Uh... We're already over the You're number referring to Interstate 40? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, because the, the current uh, traffic volume on NC-54 is 16,000, but the capacity level service T is, uh, is 27,200. Yeah. So yeah. they're well below that, and the additional traffic generated by the site will not approach that. Okay, and so, but 54 and, I mean, I'm sorry, but Interstate 40 and Fayetteville Road? Well, Interstate 40 uh, certainly is over its capacity, but this facility does not have direct access to that. And Fayetteville Road? Uh, it does not have direct access to Fayetteville Road. Okay. Thank you. Understood. You're welcome. To, is further comments by council? Further comments by council? No, sir. Uh, does anyone else in the public want to speak on this item? 
Uh, if not, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Madam Clerk, for the council. Second. It's been proper to move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 0. Moved item 25, zoning map change, Hope Valley Farms, POD, BB revision Z13 Good evening again, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Hope Valley Farms Pod BB Revisions is a request to change the zoning map designation of a 6.77 acre parcel located at 1051 Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway between South Roxborough Road and Archdale Drive. Um, this site was zoned Commercial General or CG with a development plan in 2009. And the development plan at that time included a, a large number of graphic and text commitments um, which would stay in place with what's before you tonight. And these included enhanced project boundary buffers um, and transportation improvements. Um, there are two, uh, excuse me, there are five proffers, two broad sets of proffers that the applicant is requesting to have removed from the 2009 commitments uh, and that's before you tonight. One is the removal of the proffer that uh, in the 2009 limited um, fuel sale uses and convenience store uses on this site. And the other set of uh, commitments that are being asked to be removed are roadway improvements along Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway and South Roxborough Street, which have been, have been previously provided by others. Um, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. And uh, Planning Commission recommended approval at their October 8, 2013 meeting by a vote of 11 to 0. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. You've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. Uh, I would ask council members, do you have questions of the staff initially on this item? If not, we have three persons who have signed up to speak. Uh, Patrick Biker, Louis Cheek, and Dr. Sindel or Dr. Isley. You, you, your name? Ma'am? Okay. Could, could, do you mind if you could just sign up so we can have that for a record? Uh, if you can go over and sign up. I'm sorry, could you go to the clerk's desk and just sign the yellow card, please? Right there. Is this, is that it? Okay, I, I didn't understand your name. Okay. okay. We'll get to All right. Are, are you speaking in opposition to to the plan? Okay. 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 You can have a seat. I'll call you at the appropriate time. Uh, Patrick Biker, Louis Cheek. Uh, let's take ten minutes at the most on this, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at two six one four Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham, along with my co-counsel Louis Cheek. I'm here tonight representing Murphy USA. We, were, we are requesting this minor zoning map change to 6.77 acres along the south side of Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway, directly across from the existing Walmart. I'd like to briefly introduce the rest of our team that's here tonight uh, from Murphy USA, Mr. Wayne Gibson. Our project engineers are Hamilton Williams and Greg Sistrunk from Greenberg Faro, and then our traffic engineers, Earl Llewellyn of Kimley Horn. Uh, given the time of night, I will follow the advice of our friend Howard Clement to be seen, be brief, and be seated. There are two important points to show we have accounted for potential neighborhood impacts with a development plan that is before you tonight. First, we will construct a 0.8 opacity buffer entirely within our property. To provide more detail on that committed element, a 0.8 opacity buffer means that for every 100 feet along the side and rear property lines, we will install about eight to 10 canopy trees, 11 to 17 understory trees, and about 75 shrubs. Now, to me, that's a lot of planting along 100 feet. We're talking, on average, one shrub every 16 inches. As a result, there'll be plenty of screening along the property line back towards Hope Valley Farms. Second, based on Durham GIS, it appears that the closest residence to our project is approximately 500 feet away. That's more than one and a half football fields, and that 500 feet is in addition to the 0.8 opacity buffer I just described. For those of you on the council who know where I live, my backyard is just about the same distance from Nana's restaurant as this development will be from Hope Valley Farms townhouses. Moreover, there's a committed element to ensure that any drive through facility has the speakers oriented away from the residential area that is southeast of our development. One last point. This parcel before you has been zoned commercial for the past four years. We, have, we now have a project that can implement this established zoning designation. 
We were pleased to host a neighborhood meeting about this project since there was a TIA required with this zoning map change. Accordingly, I sent out 45 personalized letters to nearby property owners. Only two of those 45 people invited came to the meeting and we had a thorough discussion with both of them about the landscape buffer I described at the start of my comments. We did not perceive either of the two neighbors to be opposed to the convenience store that we're proposing at this location. And now I'll turn the presentation over to my co-counsel, Louis Cheek, and then our team will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mayor Bell, members of the council, my name is Louis Cheek, and it's a privilege along with Patrick Biker to represent Murphy USA. Uh, Murphy is an international company based in El Dorado, Arkansas. It's fully integrated, engaging in the fuel exploration and drilling business. It's on the New York Stock Exchange. It has 1,174 convenience store sites across the U.S. 73 of these sites are in North Carolina with over 500 employees. This would be the first site in Durham. There would be seven to eight employees. We anticipate about a 1,200 square foot building with four islands with eight fuel dispensing pumps. We estimate that the site would create $2 million in tax base. And of course, there would be associated sales taxes. There will be a number of enhancements and improvements to make this development neighborhood friendly. Traffic improvements will be constructed to mitigate the effects of a modest increase in traffic. There will be no further median cuts in Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway as a result of the project. Staff has studied the project and has determined that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies. The Planning Commission voted 11-0 to recommend approval. We ask that you approve this zoning map change and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Are there questions by members of council or proponents? Recognize Council Drew Davis. Davis Thank followed you. by the mayor pro tem. Uh, well, I just want to ask the chief if you would reiterate the question I asked you earlier about the lighting and, and any uh, intrusion of lighting from this facility onto the neighbors uh, behind it. Let me leave that to one of our experts. Uh, good evening, mayor and council. Uh, my name is Hamilton Williams with Greenberg Faro. Uh, project engineer representing Murphy USA for this project. Uh, the light will, uh, the majority of the light will be under the canopy. That's where the high intensity light, and it will be recessed lighting, um, LED lighting, that will uh, primarily not spill out from under the canopy except for in the, in the perimeter drive area. The uh, <clears throat> site lighting itself will also be uh, LED lighting as well, downcast, and will definitely not ex uh, spill beyond the uh, property limits. Thank you. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Um, one of the concerns um, that I have about this uh, convenience store um, comes from complaints that I receive from residents uh, who are located near a convenience store in Ward 1. One of the problems that they um, talked about was um, noise from cars coming uh, onto the uh, convenience store property all times of night. And I'm just concerned that there might be litter on Martin Luther King Parkway from folk who are coming into the convenience store. What assurances do you have that that will not occur? I know you don't have any, Lewis, we'll, but you're gonna we'll, have to come up with some. We'll certainly monitor our property and do everything that we can to hold down the noise to deal with any litter that's generated. Um, that's a difficult problem, of course, but we'll do everything within our power to try to make sure that it's not a problem with our property. This gentleman, I think, wants to, did you? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Wayne Gibson with Murphy Oil. Our address is 422 North Washington, El Dorado, Arkansas. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, concerning uh, the noise uh, at 
convenience stores. We know that can be a problem. We've looked at uh, this area, and in particular Durham, for several years. Uh, we've looked at the demographics, uh, competition, uh, traffic uh, counts, uh, and, and locale. What we found out is where you locate in many instances, uh, that noise problem is, is not as large. And we feel like in this area where we've, we've located this site, uh, we don't feel like uh, that would be a, a real issue uh, with n cars coming in, with music blasting and so forth. And should it be, we will avail ourselves of the noise ordinance that you ha already have in place here and the, and the, and the police department uh, to take care of that. Thank you, sir. Do you pay your staff a minimum wage? That has nothing to do with your request, but I'm just interested in knowing. We're well um, above the minimum wage okay. uh, in starting. How about a livable wage? Oh, uh, uh, and, and a very livable wage as well. Okay. So most of them will be attendants or? Uh, we will have a manager, assistant manager uh, at this site and uh, five, four to five uh, cashier types that would man uh, this station. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other questions, comments? Uh, Ida. Good if evening. You could just take your name for the record, please. Is yes, this is Ida Lund Otku. Okay. Thank you. I am speaking on the behalf of Elm Grove Townhouse neighborhood and at Hope Valley Farms North proper of about uh, 240 homeowners. Um, a zone change for the adjacent property uh, at 1051 Martin Luther King Jr. was requested by an applicant. The city review process provided notifications. However, the notifications did not reach all of these at uh, these 240 um, townhouses or home, I should say homeowners. On behalf of this neighborhood, I ask that city council continue the hearing process and allow the neighborhood the opportunity to meet and speak with the applicant and form an opinion about the project. We understand requirements in the notification process were met by the city. However, due to the timing of the notification and our board elections coinciding, our third party homeowner association and our new and old neighborhood boards could not process this until after the transition was completed. Hence, 240, or I should say, most of the 240 um, properties in question did not have access to the notification and the opportunity to participate in the zone change review process as citizens. We plead that the Elm Grove townhouse neighborhood be allowed to participate in this process with continued hearings by city council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask before I move to the staff, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Staff, do you have any comments relative to the request by the young lady? I don't think we have anything to add other than uh, I think the representations the applicant made were, were fair. And again, as the um, opponent acknowledged, the notice requirements were met, and, and all homeowners within a 600 foot area were directly contacted. Okay. Let me ask if there are other questions or comments by members of the council. Councilman Moffitt. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Ms. Is it Utku? Yeah. 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 If you. I just wanted to ask uh, when you found out about the rezoning? Yes, it was at um, our um, election, Board of Election meeting. It was uh, after, it was at 9 o'clock. There was a gentleman present who expressed surprise that he was the only one at the hearings had we not heard about this. No, wait, no I just want to know what day. Oh. I think it was the, when was it? 12th. 12th, I think it was the 12th, 9 o'clock in the evening. That right. was the first time. Right, okay. Um, do you have specific concerns about uh, the, this project? We just don't know enough about it. We, didn't, we weren't given a chance of any kind, and since this is not really single dwelling homes we're talking about, we're talking townhomes, which are densely packed which I maybe, um, I don't know the planning or, you know, rules or anything or if there's any special considerations for townhomes because in the same area there are a whole lot more people than a single dwelling establishment. Um, 
we just wanted to sit down, greet them, speak with them, learn a little bit more. Um, not everybody in the uh, neighborhood is savvy with plats and um, the report that was prepared. So it would be good for everyone to just meet and greet the other side and just learn what this is all about. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, proponents, well, let me recognize Councilman Brown first. I'm sorry, what, uh, where did she go? Well, what neighborhood are you representing again? Yeah, I'm a little confused. Is that a section? Can you come to the microphone? Yeah, is that a, a section within Hope Valley? It is. Farms? There are um, three neighborhood associations that oversee Elm Grove, I mean, Hope Valley Farms. The whole area is divided into three neighborhood associations, if you will. And ours is at the very tip of Hope Valley Farms North. And it's bedding right next to the property, I guess the, the land is right next to the property in question, which is a wooded area. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve or staff, uh, can you uh, inform us again about proper notification that was was mailed to those? I would assume would that be sure the, the neighborhood that she's referring to close enough to the subject property. There are homes within the Elm Grove neighborhood that were within the 600 foot mandated notification area. Those property owners were actually sent first class notice as prescribed by both uh, local unified development ordinance standards as well as the state statute. Uh, just to remind council, here in Durham, we actually uh, provide 600% more notice than required by state law. State law only requires a 100 foot notice ring around perimeters, so we, we go well beyond that. In addition, uh, we also, uh, as a courtesy, send a notice to all neighborhood organizations or organizations that register with the planning department. Uh, and uh, we did send, I think, a handful of notices out to uh, several organizations that had registered with us. Uh, in addition, we do place legal ads in the local paper of record as required by law, and we also post a placard on the property um, to, to additionally advertise that there is a rezoning request pending. Thank you. Councilman Brown, if I may, uh, my records indicate that I did send a first class letter to the Elm Grove Townhouse Association on April 2nd of this year. It was sent directly to them. Recognize Councilman Martha. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Medlin, <coughs> since we're talking about the 600 foot notification zone, um, there's a substantial amount of property, undeveloped property that surrounds the subject property. Who owns that property? Uh, that is owned by Caswick, uh, L, the developer of Hope Valley Farms. Okay, so the, the, there's one landowner that owns a substantial amount of property. And that's primarily floodplain and stream buffer right. areas that are being retained as op permanent open space so for the So the number of residential properties that are actually within the notification zone are um, fairly limited? You are probably looking at, what, five, um, just looking at the map, uh, if you have a map in front of you, in the Elm Grove community, you're talking about the four buildings on the north side and all of the individual units, and I think uh, two or three of the internal units what? that the arc actually crossed. Yeah. Okay. Councilman Moffat, to be precise, it was 45 property owners. Be happy to share this list with you if you'd like to see it. So 45 property owners got noticed. Yes, right. plus okay, the association. You. When you say the association, I'm sorry, when you say the association, uh, what do you mean? Uh, Councilman, Council Member Moffat, the Elm Grove Townhome Association Incorporated. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to go back to the public unless you want to ask the question. Councilman Moffat, you still have the floor. I said, you're done, okay. Any other comments, questions by the council? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing on this matter and matters back before the council. Move the item. 
It's been proper to move and second. Madam Clerk, can you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes five to two with Council Member Katati voting no and Council Member Moffitt voting no. Thank you. Let's move to the next item. Item 26, street closing, North LaSalle Street. Good uh, evening. Uh, I'm sorry, good me, evening again. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a, a question before they leave. I think that uh, one of our council members uh, asked that the exterior of this convention, con convention, <laughs> Not the convention building sorry. be uh, enhanced and embellished. Uh, was that proffered with using brick? Is uh, that we'll, understood we'll by all make parties? It a, an attractive building. Well, I, I mean, it, it was brick. Brick. I thought it was brick. Now, do we have a difference on this? Uh, there were design commitments from the previous zoning that were unchanged by the action tonight. It uh, incorporated, it says, any of the following materials brick, traditional and or synthetic stucco, precast concrete panels, split face or ground face concrete masonry, hardy plank or other fiber cement siding, vinyl, stone, glass, aluminum, or metal panels. Well, let, let, me, let me just come back to this. Uh, I, I don't know who made the motion, but I specifically was told that the building was going to be brick. Same here. Say what? Well, we need, we need to make sure that's a part of the... We need to get that included as part well, of the... Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out from the, the city attorney. How do we do this so we're taking a vote on that you would the the mover would need um actually the people who voted in favor of it would need to rescind the vote and then you can vote move again okay i, I would ask the make of the motion the second of the motion to to reconsider the action that we just took yeah motion to reconsider okay. Mr. it's right. been properly moved and second madam clerk will you open the vote Close the vote. Can you close it? It's a reconsideration. So you want you want me to do it again? Yes. Uh, could you open the vote again, please? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. All right. Now can we go back to the question that's been raised in terms of the type of material that'll be used? on the building specifically? Yes, Mayor Bell, members of council, on behalf of Murphy USA, uh, we will amend our design commitments to uh, state that the building will be, uh, with the exception of the windows and the doors and the trim, be, uh, be a, a brick exterior on all four walls. Are you sure you can't make that brick window? Well, you know, I thought about that. <laughs> okay. Does, does the staff have that? Yeah, we'll uh, email it to staff in the morning. Okay. Sure. I uh, entertain a motion on the item again. So moved. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes five to two with Councilmember Katati voting no and Councilmember Moffitt voting no. Thank you. Let's Thank move you. to uh, um, street closing item 26, North LaSalle Street, street closing 13000003. Good evening again, members of council. Pat Young with Planning Department. SC 13000003 is a request by Withers and Ravenel to close a 150 linear foot segment of North LaSalle Street. Uh, this property is currently an open right of way, but has been used for many years as parking by, uh, for the adjacent building. Uh, Sheets Incorporated is proposing utilization of this property for parking and site access to a new convenience store and gas station under uh, site plan review currently by the Planning Department and other city departments. Uh, city agencies, North Carolina Department of Transportation, and uh, utility service providers uh, have reviewed this proposal, and no service delivery or other impacts were identified. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Let me ask the questions by members of the council first on this staff report. If not, we have one person that signed up to speak, uh, proponent Jamie Gerhardt. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on this item? If not, Mr. Gerhardt, you have three minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. My name is Jamie Gerhart. I work directly for Sheets Incorporated, and I'm also a new resident of the city of Durham. Uh, <laughs> we moved this summer, uh, 4605 Sycamore Shoals Road, Durham. Uh, I agree with staff's report and their support of the action item today. I'm here to answer any questions on behalf of either Sheets or uh, Withers and Ravenel, who is the applicant. Thanks. You're welcome. Are there questions of the proponent? Uh, anyone in the public wants to speak? If not, uh, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. The public hearing is closed. The matter of fact, before the council. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Welcome to Durham. Let's move to item number four, which was full. Mayor Pro Tem. Excuse me, I pulled that item with just a brief comment. Had some concerns about. Um, Workforce yes, Investment Act Youth Contract with Community yes, Partnership Inc. Yeah, I, I had some concerns about, um, I think this is the um, contract that has been awarded to a firm outside of uh, Durham, is that correct? I think there are like uh, one half point um, rating difference from between the, the, the firm Is this the contract that Operation Breakthrough was also uh, buying? Yeah, is located outside of Durham. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't. Was yeah, I just want to make sure I have the right one. Maybe I don't. City of Supreme will cooperate. Okay, here it is, CPI. $175,000. Please, I, I just don't understand um, the, the small margin uh, between the ratings, half a point for a, a firm in Durham and one in Raleigh, and Raleigh gets, do you understand what I'm saying? The rating system. Could you explain why that firm got the um, contract rather than a local firm, simply uh, my name, put. My name is Michael Honeycutt. I'm the uh, Senior Manager of Workforce Development. Um, the RFP was reviewed by members of the Durham Workforce Development Board who had the opportunity to meet with the providers, to ask questions, to review proposals. Um, the Youth Commission uh, reviewed the proposals, made a recommendation to the full Workforce Development Board, and the Workforce Development Board made a recommendation on the awarding of the contract. I'm, I'm aware of that. The, mm -hmm. the, I, I just wondered why. Well, the... Uh, uh, just a moment. Um, CPI score was, overall score was 89. Operation Breakthroughs was 88.25. Operation Breakthrough is local, CPI is not. And I just don't understand how, how uh, the is getting this award. May I? Uh, CPI has been the provider for the past three years. They have met and exceeded all measurement goals. And while I'm not a voting member of the Workforce Development Board, I believe that was a good part of their decision that the provider has met and exceeded the stated performance goals that are mandated by the state and the gov federal government. How do you mentor local firms so that they can take advantage of this uh, business in the city? How can we just think about that? Uh, but we need to do, I think, a better job of embracing our own contractors. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I was at the Dur Durham Workforce Development meeting, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, where this was discussed. Um, I think one of the things about this is this is only a six-month contract. 
uh, which would mean that we would be we would have another opportunity and another uh, uh, there, there's, there'll be some more scoring in the future for this same contract. Is that true in the near future? That is correct. So I think. Um, Cora, at the meeting, I think that there was some feeling that let's go ahead, let's keep this contract with the same group for the next six months, keep the continuity, and then we'll be bidding it out for a longer period of time. So uh, I know that that was kind of part of the thinking on part of the group. Could well, I this respond is a six month contract? Huh? I'm sorry, I didn't. This is a six month contract? Yes, it is. Begin, beginning when? I, I'm sure it's right here before me, but. January. January. So, okay. Mr. Mayor, that was still no consolation to me. Uh, business is business for Durham is business for Durham. I, I, I'm not I, disagreeing with your point. I, I just I didn't realize it was a six month contract. January through June. It is for the renewal. Well, so what's the difference now? Renewal for six months or what? Yeah, yeah. and I'm James Dickens, the youth program coordinator for Office of Economic and Workforce Development. It's a six month contract with an option for renewal for up to two years. And so we wouldn't necessarily go back to a RFP after six months unless the contract is not performing well. <clears throat> well that's, also, that's a it's, a six month, it, we, it's a six month contract because we extended, the state actually required us to extend the last contract for additional six months because we have a new reporting system that that's just uh, started in August of this year. Well, not, not, I guess I need clarification. It's a difference in saying it's a six-month renewal, and you don't necessarily have to go out for bids again. Is that what I'm hearing you saying? Right. We're right. The federal guidelines that we that the WIA fall under uh, doesn't require us to go out to RFP, but every three years. Uh, and so, since we just RFP, just had an RFP, we're not required to do that again until three years. However, we can decide, or, or uh, the Workforce Development Board, City Council can decide to request an RFP after the, at the end of six months, or we can wait for an additional two years. We usually do that based on performance. Though. So, so you have the option of doing an RFP? Yes, sir. And what, what is the prerogative do you think the board is going at? I'm, I'm trying to understand Councilman Shule's comments. Uh, we, was it understanding that we were going to try for six months and then relook at it, or what? And by relooking at it, does it mean you go out for another bid, or you just look at how they perform and decide? Whether generally, we base it off of performance. Well, the mayor pro tem raised the question: uh, I, I, for a rating that close, uh, I, I'm hard pressed to see why we wouldn't lean towards. A local firm, but uh, I, I could feel a bit more comfortable if you tell them you're going to go out and rebuild it again in six months. But if you tell them you got the option to do it, something tells me that's not going to happen. But go ahead. Right. Recognize Councilman Shule and Councilwoman Katan. Uh, the, the other issue that was raised, Mr. Mayor, was um, as I remember in the meeting, was um, the issue of a recent audit of the other applicant. Uh, and I know that that was a, had a big effect on the people that were voting on this as well. Uh, this was information that the board got, I guess, after the scoring. And so I think that was the that was the other thing that I, as I remember, and obviously I haven't gotten my recollection all right on the first thing, but as I remember, uh, that was the other big uh, item of discussion. Ask Councilwoman Katani. Yeah. Um I was also at that Workforce Development Board meeting, and I don't have it in front of me, but we did, as a board, have a lot more information in front of us, and I believe, too, that the contracts were compared on how they were going to be administered and staffing, because, again, the recommendation is to continue with the current provider, and the, the competitor, in this case, Operation Breakthrough, was going to use a different model such that they were, I believe, using interns every six months, and there were concerns about continuity um, and training and work with the youth. So there, were, there was a whole host of stuff that we looked at um, that made the current applicant stronger, and that was the board's recommendation. So I just wanted to share that. I mean, there is a lot more background information that could be shared, but that was shared with the board. 
who made the recommendation. So. Recognize the mayor pro tem. I, I still have the same question. Then how do you mentor local companies to do business with the city? Uh, that has to, you're train, you're dealing with uh, training and development, so I know there must be some model that some city is using somewhere to help local business. Uh, that is a um, concern that I have uh, and I will always have. There, there will be no opportunity uh, for Operation Breakthrough to get the kind of, of training that they need. I mean, it, it could be that interns will work, could work. They work in planning, they work in other places in city government. So I think we need to be able to think outside of the box if that is going to help us with local business. Uh, further comments on this item? I, I, I'd like to f find out a little bit more about how the, this project is pro progressing as we go into closer to the six month period. I, I, I really think that um, it's unfortunate that Operation Breakthrough isn't here to, to speak to some of the questions raised and I guess we can try to find some answers out about that. Were they aware of why they weren't awarded the contract? Yes, they have been. We okay. have met with Mr. Tabern. All right. All right. Any, any other items on this? Any other questions on this? If not, entertain a motion on the item. I'm going to leave this alone because we haven't got both people here. Um, it's been properly moved in second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes six to zero with. Six to one. Who's abstaining? You're abstaining, Ms. Smith. I'm sorry. I hit the wrong button. Are you voting no? I am voting in O. Oh, no. Okay, it passes six to one. Would Council Member Cole McFadden voting no? All right, let's move item number 10, which is on a consent agenda. Uh, financial Crimes Task Force Grant. Victoria Peterson, that's item 10. You have 10 and 11. If you want to speak on 10 first. I'm sure I'm going to get three minutes, Mr. Mayor. I think the other folks did. And since I'm the only one here to speak At on this it. late hour, Victoria, you can have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. You're Mayor. You're welcome. I have, um, I would just like to sort of ask, uh, Mr. Mayor, there are some reasons why some of us are a little concerned about our leadership in the police department. And this is one of the areas that very few of you may know this. It has been brought to my attention as an activist in this community that we have had some officers to go into persons' homes and take out monies and claim that those dollars were raised because of drugs. We have number 10 as monies that's going to come from the U.S. Department of Treasure, $23,000, an additional $3,000 in 800 to use to monitor and watch over drug monies, lottery monies, corrupt monies, basically. And I have some concerns about that. As a matter of fact, this evening I was out in, outside talking to another gentleman on this same, same issue, that there are other persons in the community that's been complaining that officers, and not all the officers, because we do have some very, very good police officers in our law enforcement, particularly the older ones. Those few over there standing over there, I consider them older officers that are very mature and they know what they're doing. But we are having some concerns about some of our younger officers. So I would like to ask the council and Mr. Bonfield, can we please get a report of the drug monies, the so-called drug monies that have been labeled that the police department has gotten over the last five years. What are we doing with those dollars? And why can't some of those dollars be used for this financial crime task force? 
because some of us do have, and I was also told that sometimes, Mr. Mayor, these drug dollars are supposed to show up in the courthouse and, they're not, and they are not showing up. So here you have crimes or persons being arrested for certain crimes, uh, but the drug monies are not there. So my question first, I think we need to get a report before we approve this. What's happening to the drug monies that you guys are getting that's coming in when you go into person's homes and they have five or $6,000 and somebody's question, well, well, why do you have this kind of money in your home and you're clearing and you're claiming that these are drug monies and you're taking those dollars and you're not giving those dollars back to those residents and to those families. And that is going on in Durham because I have not heard it just one time, Mr. Mayor. I've heard it several times. So my question here is why is it that we're giving these folks an additional $3,000, why can't they use some of your drug monies that you're already bringing into the, um, that you are already getting into the community? All right, thank, thank you, Ms. Ms. Peterson. I, I think the manager heard your, your comments. I, I would only suggest that if there are people who are making these accusations, they ought to bring them forth. They ought to bring them forth, not, not let it be hearsay, they ought to bring them forth. And, uh, the city managers here. I, I'm, I'm not asking now, but if, if you've got people, they need to bring that information forth. We can't, we can't, told, act, we can't act on hearsay. Right. I was told that. I know one person well, has already I'm spoken saying, to Mr. Baker about it. Okay. Well, you take that offline. To speak to the city manager, if you At don't least mind. That's what I've been told. Don't know if it's well, true. Well, I'm saying speak to the city manager okay. about that. We can't go but on. But I do want to. I do want. I think you need to know about it, though. Well, we appreciate that. Okay. All right. You, we want to uh, entertain a motion on this item. Okay. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will we open the vote and close the vote? It passes 7 to 0. Uh, the next item, Ms. Peterson, uh, is item 11, amendment to fitness medical risk training contract for psychological services. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have two concerns about this. First thing, I'm glad to see that uh, the police department does have somebody or, or you have hired a firm. Um, to deal with some psychiatry, uh, some counseling for your officers. I, I would like to see, to take this a little further, my understanding dealing with Mr. Um, Walker, Derek Walker, that was shot a few weeks ago. And I've heard this from police officers, because I've asked them. I have a criminal justice background, and I know how to ask questions. I've asked them, who is your licensed psychiatrist in the department? You don't have anyone in the department. So I understand that some of your officers may need counseling, may need some psychological ev uh, evaluation, but I also would like, I think some dollars need to be set aside to bring on a psychiatrist. When you have situations when a young man or a young woman is, is having a, a mental breakdown and you stand out there in the public for one hour and you talk to them, but you don't bring a licensed doctor, a licensed psychiatrist, a licensed person who has years of training to talk to that individual, but then somebody can shoot that person down because he's waving a gun. We have some concerns in this community about that. So the only thing I'm going to ask, ask Mr. Mayor and the city council members to allow to add some more monies to this so that this law enforcement can hire a licensed psychiatrist. That when we have a crisis in this community, like we had with Mr. Walker a few weeks ago, that that psychiatrist can come in and speak to that, can go down and speak to that individual. Since we're not allowing the family members, my understanding his family members tried to go down and talk to him. My understanding the pastor was asked to go, to, uh, asked to go down and talk to him, him, Mr. Mayor. None of those individuals were allowed to talk to, sit, to talk to this individual, Mr. Davis, who was having mental illness, who was having a mental breakdown publicly. But what we do, what we do, and it wasn't just that police officer, we as a community made a decision to do what we did because we're not making sure that this law enforcement department 
has the kind of equipment and the materials and the right kind of personnel that, that they really need to have. So I'd rather see some additional monies added here, uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Bonfield, to bring on a licensed psychiatrist who is certified, board certified, and thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Our comments will take, be taken into consideration. Entertain a motion on the item. Move it. Second. There's been a prompting move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 0. Thank you. Any other items to come before the council before we adjourn? If not, the council is adjourned at 10 22 p.m. Thank you.